Welcome everybody um, to Local Lit 2020, the pandemic edition. This is our eighth annual author fair um, sponsored by the San Jose Public Library and San Jose State University. Um, we are together. Yes, we are recording. Um, we are together um, as one I, at King Library. This is a joint venture. And we are so happy to have you all here with us today. Next slide, please. This is a little schedule of events to come. Um, I would uh, like to introduce Tony for a second. Tony, if you can appear. Tony, are you there? Tony? Yep. Here. Okay, this is um, our wonderful volunteer, Tony Lope, and he will be providing us with the sound of a lion, um, indicating that our panelist time is up. Thank you, Tony. Um, okay, um, again, this is Local It 2020, the pandemic edition. Um, we hope that in 2021, um, but whoops. Um, but this is what we have today, and we are going to make this work. So, um, welcome again, everybody. And, um, Anne, would you like to introduce yourself? Anne Aggie, um, San Jose State University. Anne, take it away. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to Local Lit 2020. I'm Anne Agee. I'm the interim dean of the SJSU University Library. I am really impressed by the variety of talent we have with us here today. Literature of all kinds has the ability to change the world. The nonfiction authors here inform the readers and move them to think in new ways. One of the many satisfactions of publishing is to know that your words will reach beyond the people you know to influence people you've never met. You have added to the ongoing intellectual debate and your ideas can now reach worldwide. Novels also influence people. They can change beliefs about what is right and wrong and move people to act by engaging their emotions as well as their minds. At the start of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe, author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. He famously declared that this is the little lady who started this great war. Even if you don't start a war, novels can entertain and enhance our understanding of the many ways people experience the world. Fiction can also fire up the imagination and help people think about how the world could be rather than how it is. After reading 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, the inventor Simon Lake became entranced with the idea of traveling under the ocean and went on to invent the first successful submarine. Poetry can be as exciting as Jules Verne's adventure stories. It can illuminate thoughts and emotions previously hidden from view and take people into the ocean of their unacknowledged feelings. Poetry throws light on aspects of life that were previously unconsidered which is an adventure in itself. For the authors, I'm sure writing your books was an adventure too. And every author in this room has a story to tell, but wasn't it worth the effort? The books displayed here today are their own reward. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, Next, I would like to invite Michelle. Michelle, or not to say a few words, and Michelle is um, with San Jose Public Library. Michelle, go ahead and introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everybody. In typical COVID fashion, I'm doing the opening remarks from my car um, <laughs> because that's just how things happen right now. Um, the fact that this event has been able to happen um, in a virtual format is, is really a team effort and I really appreciate everyone 
um, who's come together to make this event happen. This is one of the most important events of the year that San Jose Public Library and the university do together as a partnership. The event is important because it brings together our communities in, in a way that allows us to one, explore all of the creativity and all of the thoughtfulness that so many people um, who are creative types, writers, um, nonfiction researchers, poets come together and share. The important part about local lit is that we get to hear from people whose voices may not be heard in traditional venues um, from mass market publications um, or even um, you know, in an online format. This local lit event is, is really a celebration of all of the diversity of Silicon Valley, all of the diversity that um, we have in our communities. The range of the authors and the range of the works this year um, are really astounding. Um, some surprising things about um, uh, discoveries in San Jose, um, some heartfelt um, uh, memoir, um, really a, an, an expression and an example of um, the thoughtfulness of, of what goes into people's everyday lives. Um, the, the, the things that are, are normal, the things that are, can be somewhat mundane, um, somehow the authors have, have turned them into um, absolutely uh, brilliant pieces of um, representation, works of, of imagination um, that have absolute profound impact on people. So welcome everybody, congratulations to all of the authors. And for those of you that haven't had a chance to read all of the books, you're, you're in for an absolute, absolute treat. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Oops. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, I also want to add that all of these books are available at uh, San Jose Public Library. So um, authors will be letting you know where you can purchase them, but if um, funds are tight, um, just remember that you'll find these books at the library. All right, um, now I would very much um, like to introduce, next slide please, um, our keynote um, speaker, Tom Leggett, um, who has uh, grown up here in San Jose and shares in his books, uh, The Pregnant Majorette and Mozart in the Garden, Life of um, life of a very difficult childhood, and um, he survived, as you can see, and he has become one of the foremost Rosarians in the world. Tom, please um, take it away. Thank you. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. From ages 16 through 18, I wrote a weekly column for the San Jose Mercury News. The articles were just two column inches long, but the harried manic reporter to whom I dictated in the middle of the night demanded perfect copy every time. The reporter didn't have to worry about my copy. I had been working as a printer's devil or helper since I was about 12. During the five years I worked for the old printer, he repeatedly stated, kid, follow your copy out the window. In layman's terms, that means the words we print, write, or edit are holy things which must not be defiled. We must remain faithful to the copy we are given or that we write. But how does someone remain faithful to the written word? If you're a printer, you print the words the client provides to you, even if they don't sound right. The printers I worked for printed many cringeworthy things, but that was part of the business. It is more difficult for people who just sit down to write something. There is much more to be faithful to than a printer's single line of copy. Practice is the most important thing every good writer needs. The old printer who hired me to be his devil said, kid, only an idiot publishes anything without running it through an editor first. The old printer's frequently revealed need for someone to check his copy was right on target. A good editor can prevent, can prevent any writer from looking like a fool. My personal tale of good editors I have used has a cautionary ending. I have been used poorly by one publisher, 
three editors, a screenplay writer, and a publicist. Those people took advantage of my zeal to publish books. Beware of anyone who says they can help you write, design, publish, or publicize a book, especially if they want money for their services. Choose wisely, since book professionals of all abilities and experience levels advertise online. Judging from my personal experience, it is, it is the people who claim they can publicize your book and greatly increase sales who have the most potential to charge you a lot of money and return very little. Beyond that, I don't have a lot of good news to offer authors. Fewer people than ever read or buy books, yet I meet more and more new authors. Few of their books sell. My famous editor is telling her would-be clients, don't publish a book unless you have an exceptional interesting book or are just doing it for fun. I can offer those who want to sell or promote their own books just one hope. Be an interesting public speaker. Find groups, with groups which will let you speak or sell or promote your book. Hand selling is the way to go for modern authors. Some people in the audience are thinking, but what about bookstores, Tom? I have an absolute proven reply to that question. In August 2017, my patient wife Blanche and I embarked, embarked on a continent spinning book tour, which went from San Jose, California to Portland, Maine and back. 16,298.2 miles in 72 days. I can't believe we did it. We removed the rear seats from an eight passenger Mercedes limousine and packed it with luggage and over a thousand copies of the two books I had just published. About a ton of books to be specific. Our goal was to donate copies to local bookstores and little free library boxes all across the lower 48 American states. Most of the few properous, prosperous looking bookstores we found were operated by strident feminists who loved my wife but spoke to me just long enough to get me out the door. The used bookstores we found were bursting at the seams with moldy titles, homeless men, and few customers. Plant nurseries were filled with plants they couldn't sell and too many employees. They surely didn't work my books. Since we seemed to have no other viable options, my wife and I left over a thousand copies of my books in little free library boxes all across the North American continent. Though the library boxes varied greatly, many sported signs which read, no romantic comedies, please. Writers of romantic comedies take note. I did not attempt to get any of my three books published by a big name company. Why? because the book industry in 2020 looks an awful lot like the Rose business did in the year 2000. It is dead, even though its various parts are still twitching. I emphatically state that most, if not all of the writers who are listening to me will be more successful if they publish their own titles as opposed to going through traditional publishing sources. The best advice I can give any writer is quite simple. Hire a well-known editor get a good book designer, or work with free online book publishing services. The San Jose Public Library System offers many resources for independent writers. I suppose the punchline for my review of my 54 long, year long writing career is simple. In 2020, we should be satisfied, satisfied because we are writers. Be like most of the farmers I know, they work day jobs to support their farming habit. Get a day job to support your writing habit or marry well so you can spend your days writing books and your nights giving foot rubs. Hey, there are worse jobs. Keep it cheap, keep it fun are the catchphrases for authors. Whatever you do, please don't be discouraged by the changes in the modern literary world. Sometimes the doing of a thing brings us more joy than does the completed work. Mother Earth chooses to provide some of us with gifts. It is a normal thing for us to desire money from the talents we have been given, but perhaps we are asking too much. Perhaps the simple possession of writing skill is enough, but if you must have money for your books, hand selling might be the key. 
thank you all for listening to the ramblings of a man who consistently sells books on Amazon, if only in small quantities. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you very much. And we'll hear more about um, the tools and um, the availability of uh, self-publishing promotion at the San Jose Public Library to come during this very production. Okay, beautiful, Tom, thank you again. Next slide, please. Okay, um, Megan, if you are able, take it away. Thank you, Deborah. Hi, everyone. Uh, and also, Deborah, thank you for stepping in in case my technical difficulties get the better of me. M much appreciated. So first, for our, for our very first panel, we have self-care. For this, um, we are happy to introduce three authors. Lisa Francesca, who wrote Helen and the Masters, A Portrait of a California Mystic. Do you want to go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about your book, Helen? Or, uh, sorry, Lisa? Absolutely. Hello. I've um, written Helen oh, and the yeah. Masters, A Portrait of a California Mystic, which is available on Amazon. A ranch wife in early 20th century Bay Area discovers an ability to write down compelling messages from spirits. As she wrestles with this strange gift and faces resistance from her family, she inches toward discovering her own voice. This is a biography of my great grandmother, whom I have been deeply curious about ever since I discovered some of her writings when I was a child. While researching and writing this book, I discovered a brave, passionate woman who endured earthquake, floods, fires, and a flu pandemic while managing ranches, packing across the Sierra, and raising seven children in the Sacramento Delta. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Lisa. Next, we have Martha Hernandez who wrote uh, I have what it takes, stories and principles that will ignite your natural leadership. Please go ahead and talk, tell us about your book, Martha. Thank you. Yes, really excited to present this book. It's a combination of stories, mostly Latina writers from all walks of life, age, and also representing several Latin American countries, some of us born in the States, but all with a very similar story. And that's the trajectory and journey in building something great ourselves. As a uh, Mexican-American living in Oakland and growing up thinking that I would want to start my own company in tech, um, it's been really, really difficult. So my story talks about that journey and really gives the opportunity for young people, young women, specifically young Latinas in representation and seeing themselves in that this big dream can be done. I have what it takes available, Amazon, Target, and also on Barnes and Noble, but at my living room too. So I can actually send it if you wanna send me an email um, and write something nice for you. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Martha. And finally, we have Nilo Nori. Nilo's 21 Recipes from a Shelter in Place. Please go ahead and tell, you about, tell us about your book, Nilo. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Um, after I lost my job with the onset of the pandemic, I began spending more time in the kitchen, cooking for my family. And uh, the foods that I prepared during this time were either healthy and immune boosting or our favorite restaurant food, which we couldn't get because restaurants were closed in the beginning of the pandemic. And um, I decided to publish this collection of our recipes from that time. What's unique about the collection is that the recipes are presented in a very simple and visual manner where uh, there are images showing different steps and the ingredients, process, and final products are shown with photos and text that's written directly on the photos. So there's not a lot of lengthy description. Um, it's a very visual, simple, and accessible cookbook. It's available on my site as well as on Amazon. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you very much for sharing. All right. So for our first panel, for the self-care panel, uh, why don't we go ahead and start with a question. What research did you do to write your book? Could you go ahead and uh, start for us, Lisa? 
Sure. I um, am lucky that many people in my family tended to write memoirs. So uh, they were only published within the family, but I had a lot of material to work with there. I also uh, read more than 25 books, I think, as supplemental material. And I did some field work. So I spent some time in the Delta just feeling the area and absorbing the atmosphere. Excellent, thank you so much. Okay, how about for you, um, Martha? What was the most difficult part? Oh, I'm sorry, what research did you do to write your book? <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I actually did lots of research um, in relation to Latinas in technology and starting and entrepreneurship. Um, did find that less than 1% actually get venture-backed um, uh, enterprises or built venture-backed enterprises. And I found that to be um, really significant in the way in which I wanted to present data through the story um, from Nopalera to CEO, which is the very first story in the book. Um, and I also found a lot of research in relation to uh, engineers coming particularly from, from Mexico um, or working in Mexico for American companies. And yet here in the US, um, Latinos, specifically those of Mexican descent, not being uh, included or invited into the tech ecosystem. So I found that really, really uh, intriguing, um, but it was mostly research uh, papers um, that uh, have been already written and presented as as an opportunity to showcase the, um, the gap there is an opportunity to tech advancement in the Latino community, particularly the Mexican American community here in the US. Excellent, thank you so much, Martha. And Naila, can you tell us a little bit about the research you did to write your book? Sure, um, so in addition to dishes that uh, I normally make uh, you know, throughout my adult life, I uh, did some research into ingredients and recipes that uh, improved the immunity uh, during during the beginning, especially beginning of the pandemic. A lot of people were concerned um, about that to boost our immune system. And also trying new recipes, uh, our favorite restaurant foods uh, that the kids and my children um, were not getting at that time. So trying new recipes and coming up with one that worked for us. Um, and because I didn't have ex access to tasters, uh, my children and my husband were the people that tested the recipes and gave me feedback. And also, um, I used the, the process of the book itself, the presentation, to have my uh, kids try the recipes um, to see how how effective or um, you know actually uh, practical the recipes were. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, now, at this time, are there any questions for the audience, for our authors? Uh, please feel free to go ahead and type them in. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with the second question and look for uh, author questions afterwards. So how about, um, could anybody tell me what was the most difficult part of your book for you to write? If anybody would like to jump in for that one. I'll jump in on that one. I would actually say that finding the structure for this book was, was really hard for me because I was taking a biography and a regional kind of history and also merging it with these messages from spirits as it were. And, and so it took a, a good two and a half or three years for me to find the right structure. And finally, uh, when things began to fall in place, then I was able to charge ahead. I wonder if other uh, authors have that, that issue of structure. You know, what's really interesting about um, writing a book is that I have friends that have, have been thinking about writing a book for years. I have others um, in my network that their dream is to write a book and yet they've not done it, right? They haven't started it or not know how to start. And I didn't really have that as a thing that I wanted to do from you know the checklist and like, oh, I'm gonna be an author or write a book. But I began writing as, as an opportunity to share with my community, my journey and my struggles and also my learnings um, in, in really in, 
in a giving way, right? So that others could have this resource and see themselves represented so that they wouldn't give up and keep on going because there was light at the end of the tunnel with the, with the journey. So as I was writing this mini novelas, I was writing a little chapter every week. Um, eventually I finished it and it felt like, um, like an organic process. Uh, later, obviously, with the editors being involved and the other writers and their feedback, the product uh, became what it is now. Um, but it all began by just sitting down and writing. Um, and I have to say, maybe a, a couple of challenges. One of them was, uh, I, you know, I felt like there was this time time crunch for me because because of the topic, you know, shelter in place. Uh, and of course I thought that shelter, we would not be in shelter in place or this pandemic would be over so quickly. And I wanted to get these recipes out. Um, so there were, you know, uh, maybe a month or longer where I was working 10 or 12 hours in my kitchen, just trying out the recipes, taking pictures and, um, you know, figuring out what's gonna be in the book. And also uh, to Lisa's point about the structure, um, I, I, the look and feel of the book and what it would be like was kind of a, a difficult part, a difficult decision to make because essentially this is a picture book. Uh, you know, here's a sample page, so it was, it wasn't very easy for me to figure out how it was going to look and feel. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So it doesn't seem like we have any questions from our audience yet. Don't forget, audience, you can go ahead and uh, type your questions into the question and answer box, and we'll be sure to see them. We do have a question from one of our authors, Martha Ingberger asks, what comments have you been receiving from readers about your book so far? Well, you know, in, in thinking about like the strategy and releasing a book, um, we actually, uh, the authors involved, we sent messages to our friends. We actually invited them to, um, to rate our book, particularly on Amazon. But surprisingly enough, we actually got ratings from people that we didn't know um, and that actually bought the book and, uh, and were really excited to see stories that they had never really seen represented. Um, stories where they felt like it was um, uh, it was intimate, and they themselves found a, a, a voice. And so, so far, the comments have been very positive in um, in sort of the representation space. Um, but really, about the, the 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 reason why we wrote this book, it was to really ignite this natural leadership amongst people who um, have always saw themselves as sort of followers, right? Somebody else has the answer, somebody else uh, takes the lead. And so what we have found is a real uh, authentic um, uh, response in people taking lead and doing the thing because they saw that they could too. Um, and in terms of comments, uh, the first, 50 books that I uh, had printed out, I actually gave to family members because they were her relatives too. And uh, that was so scary. It was similar to going to a very large family reunion and realizing you don't have any clothes on. But uh, what I've gotten from them have been very kind comments. And also I got a jar of jam from one of my aunts. So um, I'm a winner. And uh, for myself as well, it's, the feedback has been very positive. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's unique in the sense that it's a cookbook, but there, there isn't a lot of reading and, uh, you know, in description, lengthy information. It's very simple. It's clear. Uh, it shows exactly what you need to have on the images itself. And then the next image is... Uh, the process, you know, if you have to mix something or boil something, and then the, the process goes like that. So it's all with uh, images, and I'm actually learning from uh, families that their children, their maybe teenagers or college age students, the generation Zers, are using some of the recipes because it's very simple and quick and visual. Yes, do any of you have any additional books in the works? 
yes, uh, yes, I do. Uh, when I was studying my great grandmother, I discovered another ancestor um, who I had never heard of, who had a wildly artistic and journalistic background um, during the Civil War era, and I realized I had to write about her. So uh, I'll be working on that the next six years, probably. How about you, other authors? So, um, Martha, do you want to go next? Yeah, I've been, thank you. I've been sort of tackling with this um, uh, sort of in the back of my mind, and I began um, already uh, writing a little bit about this, but is um, in essence sexuality and and Latina bodies and uh, supporting women and understanding how to best you know live their lives without um, uh, waiting for uh, for someone else to make you feel good um, uh, centrally and in intimacy. So that's something that I've been thinking about, and I think I'm gonna make that happen sooner rather than later because I've heard that 65% of women um, are not satisfied uh, sexually. So I think there's an audience for my book. <laughs> okay, that sounds a lot more interesting than my next book. Um, so, you know, it's very fitting that my book was placed in the self-care group uh, because this book has uh, in many ways kept me sane during this time of pandemic. Uh, I lost my job, which was very fast paced and traveling and very exciting. I completely stopped in March. Uh, so this book was my savior. Um, it's been great to be involved more and more with food. I love it. And I'm now working on one that will be just a vegetarian one, uh, uh, you know, presented in a sim similar visual manner. And hopefully in the future, um, I'd like to put one out that's a Persian recipe. Thank you, ladies. One final question from John Hogel. He asks, as a former bookstore owner, public librarian, and college librarian, he's seen a decline in print readership. Are you getting more ebook or print book customers? Um, before I wrote Helen and the Masters, I wrote a wedding officiant's guide. And I've noticed over the years that print has consistently outsold ebooks, even though there's a nice steady ebook sales. So uh, for this one, I decided to stick to just print for now. Yeah, when we first actually released the book, we did um, ebook first, and we um, we actually saw an increase when we released the the, the print version. Um, I do have similar to what Tom recommended. We we did a very grassroots effort. And so I personally purchased a ton of books and I'm doing conferences primarily with student um, led uh, organizations um, in the empowerment, um, particularly of women. And so that's one of the things that I always offer is, you know, the book. And I know, and here's the other thing, I don't make cost be the issue. So if I can sell it at cost, I will do that. Um, because I, I believe in, in the power of the story, um, but it's been an exciting um, momentum that has been building and uh, you know, people are willing to pay for it, especially if it's coming with a nice little message and it's you, uh, very unique. Nilu? Um, even though my book is also available on Kindle, I've noticed that it's, the print version has sold more. Um, and the one that I sell is also spiral bound, but for cookbooks, I guess it's just easier for people to use this kind of mm -hmm. cookbook. Ladies, thank you so much for everything you've shared about the writing process, how you started, your experience, and your passion. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, everybody. Um, we'll now have uh, Lucille. Next panel, we have four writers on uh, relationships and family. Um, Daniel E. Johnson, Disposable, When Dating is Not Enough, Loving Your Neighbor. Uh, E.K. Trimberger, Crayol's Son, An Adopted Mother, Untangles Nature and Nurture. Linda Ulysite, The Aloha Spirit. 
and Tina Jones Williams, a delicate balance. Um, Daniel Johnson, disposable when your dating is not enough. It, sorry, is not loving your neighbor. Uh, Daniel, tell us about your book. Thank you. Well, dating is the topic that won't go away. For most of us, it evokes perhaps a silent groan for others mixed emotions at best. This book is not another how-to book devoted to dating techniques. Rather, it explains why people do what they do and offers a new perspective. When it comes to relationships, what makes people tick? I've given this question thought and study and concluded that selfish interests are what drive us. In dating, as it's commonly practiced, this selfishness is taken to an extreme. I write in my book that selfishness in the dominant dating culture most clearly manifests itself in the attitude that human relationships and by implication people themselves are disposable. So what's the remedy? In a phrase, love your neighbor, which includes friendship at a minimum. As you might have surmised, these ideas have been informed by religious sentiment, but the book has been written so that those who embrace another worldview will not necessarily be offended. It's available on Amazon. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Our next uh, speaker is E.K. Trimberger, Creole son and adoptive mother untangled nature and nurture. Um, E.K., please unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, yes, okay, you can hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, this book is a memoir of my experience as a single Berkeley mother who in 1981 adopted a five-day-old mixed-race boy from Louisiana. My decision to write a very personal memoir stemmed from helping my son when he was 26 to find his Louisiana birth parents and their extended family. They were accepting, but I was surprised by how much he had in common with these people he had never met. They shared personality traits, interests, abilities, and problems, especially a history of addiction. In trying to understand this, I discovered the field of behavioral genetics, formed as a new field in the 1970s by quantitative psychologists. Their work is mainly based on research on adoptive families and stresses the interaction of nature and nurture. I could use my academic background as a social scientist to make these, this research available to a general audience in non-academic prose. Thank you. Thank you, E.K. Linda Yulisite is author of The Aloha Spirit, a novel. Hi, uh, my novel is set in territorial Hawaii. It was inspired by my husband's grandmother and it's available on Amazon and bookshop.org. Dolores's mother dies when she's a baby and her father leaves her with a Hawaiian family when he goes to the mainland to look for work. The Hawaiian family works her very hard and it isn't the family Dolores wants. Trying to find her own love, Dolores marries a Portuguese man named Manolo. His large family embraces her, but when his drinking leads to physical abuse, only his relative Alberto comes to his rescue, her rescue, and sparks a passion within Dolores that she hasn't known before. Staunch Catholics can't divorce, however, so after the Pearl Harbor attack, Dolores flees with her two young daughters to California, only to be followed by both Manolo and Alberto. In California, Manolo's drinking problems continue, and Alberto's begin. My uh, book is mostly about the Aloha spirit, finding it within yourself so you can model it. Thank you, Linda. And our final uh, panelist will be uh, Tina Jones Williams, A Delicate Balance, Days That Shaped a Lifetime. Hi, good afternoon. I am the author of eight books and I have to think that um, the most terrifying question an author can be asked is what is your book about? Particularly when you write about relationships and people, the book is about everything and nothing. Um, a Delicate Balance is the third and final book in a series. And it leans on my belief that if you follow people for 10 days, and get an intimate look into their lives, you can know pretty much who they are. 
A Delicate Balance is about a Pullman porter and his wife, a domestic day worker. And it takes a look at their strong beliefs, their values, their triumphs, their sadnesses. And really it's a walk down memory lane. My books are available on Amazon. Thank you, Tina. Uh, I want to open it um, the, up to questions from the audience. Uh, please um, submit your questions through chat or Q&A. Um, again, our panel is on relationships and family. Now, I have a question to start off with for the panel, um, and that is, was there a real life relationship or a real life incident that inspired your work? Uh, Daniel, could you go first and then others can uh, join in as needed? Well, there's no single incident, but, but I would say like most people, I was very frustrated with the, the whole dating culture, the whole dating scene in, in high school and college. And that, that stimulated my thinking, if you will, about the subject. And uh, the more I thought about it, the more uh, dissatisfied I came with the, the, the cultural underpinnings, which as I mentioned earlier, it, it was essentially just, you know, the modus operandi seemed to be selfishness and how can, how can you get what you, whatever you can get rather than what you can give, which is really a much better way to go about relationships. When, when people get into marriages, no marriage counselor would say, oh, you should try to get everything you can out of this. I mean, that's, that's almost a recipe for failure. And likewise, when, when people date, they, um, they'll find it goes much better if, if they look, look for ways to be friends and, and put that first. Well, um, my book is a memoir, but um, I was inspired to adopt at a, as a 40 year old single woman, one reason was to better relate to my family of origin who were very into family and children. And I succeeded to some extent, but then racial issues intervened. My whole family and all of my close friends are white, um, although my neighborhood and my block and Berkeley is mixed race, but um, that's a complication, you know, that became an issue later uh, by teenage years. Um, I also wanted to say that um, I've really written this book for parents, or that is who's really responded to it, not only adoptive parents, but other, every, all kinds of parents, who've said that reading my book makes them feel less guilty about how they raise their children. Um, I also, uh, both adoptive parents and adult adoptees have said that my book makes them rethink their own experiences of adoption. So um, at any rate, uh, that's my answer. My book is about my husband's grandmother. So it's something that she's a woman that just inspired me immensely. She was a fabulous woman. I admired her immensely. And I always wondered how having a horribly, very difficult upbringing in childhood, how she got to be as warmly welcoming as she was as an adult. We could, I could pick 10 of my friends and go over to her house so that she'd invite us in for dinner. She just was an amazing woman. And I felt that her story needed to be told. I think that um, a delicate balance obviously is written about people who, who had real jobs. They were uh, Pullman porters and domestic day workers, which were the first jobs, paid jobs available um, right out of slavery. Those are the first jobs that black people could get and be paid for. Um, the, over the years, I've heard this, this quote that um, writers write not to be understood, but to understand. There were very uh, specific things that I wanted to make sure were brought up and that I fully understood about these jobs because they are very iconic in the black community. Um, within our families, we had people that were Pullman porters um, and domestic day workers and, and certainly within our neighborhood. So yes, very much this book is about actual people and their actual stories. Mm -hmm. 
Another question for the panel. Um, how important are families in your work? Who would like to start? I can start with that one. Thank um, you, families, my, my protagonist is somebody who has not really ever had a family. So in her mind, the story starts when she's seven and her father leaves her. So in her mind, she builds up this beautiful image of what a family is and she never quite gets there. So in Hawaii, the, the idea of the aloha spirit is somebody who is comfortable loving everything around them. You know, good, bad, indifferent things, everything. But in order to get there, you first have to learn to love yourself. And that's what Dolores has to do. She has to figure out how to make herself happy with what she has before she can create the kind of family that she wants to create for her daughters. And again, that was based on what actually happened with my husband's grandmother and her daughters and how she was able to create that sense of family from actually very little. I'll go with, <clears throat> within the field of adoption until very recently, there was the notion that you could just take any child from any place, uh, from any family and just create an, a nuclear family, the adopted family that would be no different from a biological family. I think that is no longer the case. Uh, you can't really think that that's true after you've read my book, but you can think about forming new types of extended families that would include birth families and adopted families and, and kin on both sides. So I advocate that, um, but I, I don't think you can just think that an adoptive family is exactly like uh, a biological family. Um, and rather than a nuclear family, it's important to farm, especially for the adoptee, to have relationships with the birth family and with the adopted family. And, you know, and if possible relationships between other members of those families. Thank you. So one of the chapters of my book is, is a history of courtship and dating in America. And it turns out that they've evolved quite a bit over, over, the, over the years, over the centuries. Courtship actually was much more of a com community and family oriented affair. Um, as with the advent of dating about 100 years ago, things became much more individualized and people started to pull back from, from, from family and family structures. Uh, and I, I, generally speaking, I don't think pulling back from families has been, been helpful. Uh, and uh, uh, as things have become more privatized. Um, in, in my book, um, Violet, and Everett, our husband and wife, who have known each other since birth. They grew up um, across the street from each other. And once they were married, they moved into the husband's family home. So continued to be very part, very much a part of the neighborhood which they grew up in. So family are central to this story. I have a question for E.K. Have you or you, your son, sorry, have you and or your son continued to have ongoing relationships with members of his birth family? Um, <clears throat> he did for quite a while, particularly with a half sister on the father's side. And I did for quite a while with his stepmother on the father's side, even though the father's side is the Creole side, the, the you know, more people of color, both of us were able to relate to them a little bit easier than the birth mother's white family, even though she also had three mixed race children. Partly, I think, because that family, the white family felt guilty. They were the ones who had decided to put the baby up for adoption. Um, those relationships have kind of you know, gone away, partly because of these addiction issues that are still, that aren't resolved, even though in the end of my book, it seems like maybe they are, but they aren't. So thank you for the question. Okay, a question about if um, there's always more to telling a story or to writing. Now, if you had a chance to update your book and maybe add an afterword or a new introduction, what would you include? 
or if even if you re rewrote the book. Um, who would like to go first? Yes, E. Yeah, I'll go. I'll go first again. Um, if I was going to rewrite the book or write a new introduction, I would deal much more with race. There's a lot of anecdotes in my book and my memoir about how race uh, and racism affected my son and, and indirectly affected me. Um, but I didn't theorize that. I really wanted. I really focused on the nature nurture, the genetics and biology issues. But you know, given when it was published, I feel like I would like to do more with race and with kind of generalizing about race from my experience and my son's experience. And I'm trying to do that now through some writing of essays or uh, a blog on my blog on psychology today called Adoption Diaries. Um, so I would definitely do more with race issues and how they impact uh, you know, transracial adoption. I, I have particularly found relevant and useful Isabel Wilkerson's current book called Cast. And that gave me some new insights, which I hope to write about. Thank you, E.K. Uh, Daniel, um, is there anything more that you would write about uh, your book and your topic? No, I don't think so. I, I, if I were to do a sequel, I think what I would do is consider putting together a, an anthology, if you will, of, of, of pe people's stories having come, in, come out of dating relationships and just explaining what happened and, and why it worked and why it didn't work. Um, not, in a, not in a gossip column format, but just people being down to earth and explaining um, how, they, how they view things working out in, in retrospect or not working out. Letting them tell their stories. Well, I know with my book, um, I had not intended to write a sequel, but I've had several people want to know what happens next. Because when you're writing somebody's life, you can't write the whole life, you have to write a piece. So after the story ends, of course, there's more to her life. And I had not really intended to write that, but I've had several people ask me about a sequel. So I'm kind of thinking about how that would look. <laughs> I don't think that there's um, more to the story that I would write, but there are characters that I might add to the story just to bring a different dimension and a different feeling and a different um, way of living that wasn't uh, really part of the story, but could be germane. So I think I could flesh it up out a little more in that way. Okay, we have another question from the audience and with about uh, four minutes left. Uh, since several of your titles dealt with race, did you find that there was any additional interest in your story during or after the racial protest of the summer? And this is to all panelists. So anyone can pick up here. My, you know, it, it, that's really an interesting story. I mean, an interesting question. Um, I think that because the primary focus of my stories is people and relationships um, from a historical standpoint, I didn't really see any change in interest level um, as a result of what happened during the summer. I think that people um, have a continuing interest in stories about people and relationships. Well, I found that it's been, my book was published on April 1st by uh, Louisiana State University Press. And I found it's been harder to get publicity going um, during the pandemic. I mean, harder in general and harder for me as an author to really work on promoting it as, you know, as our speaker in the beginning recommended. Um, so no, um, and the field of um, adoption is very politicized now and that's also affected me. I didn't get to say that the, the introduction to my book was written by um, Andrew Solomon, the New York prize winning author of Noonday Demon and of Far From the Tree. 
and um, you know, and that's helped a little, but he's also uh, writing his own book where he interviewed my son and, and myself. So we'll be there. Or, or there's an audio book by him uh, called New Family Values where my son and I are both interviewed independently. Um, but uh, I don't know. I mean, it, I think it should, but I don't think my, my book deals, as I just said, deals, deals directly enough with race. Um, so, which I wish I had done more of that, but who can know? I mean, I was working on this for 10 years, who knows? Five, when I made a decision five years ago to just to really focus on the biology issues. Does any one of the panelists have a question for the other panelists? Um, I would like to know, Tina Williams said she had written some other books um, and I would just want to know about them and um, if they also deal with these issues of the history of the black community. You know, it's, it's funny that, that you would ask me that. You mentioned that your uh, book is, you're in Berkeley. Um, I was born and brought up in South Berkeley. Huh. Um, as a matter of fact, four of my books are set in South Berkeley. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're the Julia Street story and the, they're books that were written about the time and place that I grew up and the issues that we dealt with um, in, in those times. They start in 1943, 10 years before I was born through today. So very much um, South Berkeley, Berkeley is se very segregated and has always been. Right. Uh, you know, South Berkeley was the only place where people of color could live and buy homes. And still very much South Berkeley, you know, if, if there were a place where black people live, that's where it is in Berkeley. So yes, the books are, they, you know, because they are about people and the people are black, they are about race. Yes. Well, South Berkeley now, I don't, are, do you still live here in the East Bay? I don't, but I do a biannual neighborhood walk um, there. Um, you know, South Berkeley now, or especially Southwest Berkeley is getting gentrified. And my neighborhood, which is in central Berkeley near Ashby and, and, and uh, Shattuck is, uh, there's a few black families here. Um, yeah. I'm going to have to interrupt and say thank you all. Thank you, Tina, Daniel, and Linda, and E.K. for uh, you. your part on the panel. Okay, if we could have the next slide. Thank you very much, Lucille. Um, our next panel uh, is Collections which is comprised of stories and poetry. I want to welcome back Brad Ashmore, author of the Unexpected Tales Collection, um, Charles um, Albert, Charles Joseph Albert, A Thousand Ways to Fail and Other Stories, Dan Brooke, author of Sweet Nothings, and uh, Kathleen uh, Gonzalez, author of A Beautiful Woman in Venice, and Robert Ricardo Reese, um, who has written a collection of poems entitled Monterey. Next slide, please. All right, Brad. Thank you very much. Um, so my name is Brad Ashmore, and I've been writing short stories for a very long time. The book that's now in the library is a collection of 27 stories and they are illustrated as well. There's probably a dozen or two uh, illustrations in there. The stories are mainly science fiction, but they also are uh, literary fiction and humor and the absurd as well. So uh, quite a gamut of genres and themes. For me, writing is a fun escape from the rigor of uh, technology work. I do a lot of uh, work in the technical fields so the science fiction stories are on the soft side. You know, science fiction can be soft or hard. These are on the soft side and more character driven than techie. For example, the cover illustration that you're looking at 
uh, is a scene in a, uh, from one of the stories that takes place in the clouds above Venus. And what you're seeing there is the floating mansion of a billionaire uh, eccentric. And the story that takes place in this is the uh, upstairs, downstairs conflict between all these different people. You can buy my books on Amazon. Thank you. Brad, thank you so much. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, Charles, present. Okay, so uh, my collection of stories is A Thousand Ways to Fail. It's a collection of 14 speculative stories. Uh, it's available at Barnes and Noble and at Amazon. This covers a wide range of the genre uh, from classic sci-fi to magical realism. One of the common threads through them all is that I try to find some humor in the darkness presented. Eight of these pieces have appeared in print or online in a variety of magazines. The title story, which is the longest in the collection, is also the last one, is previously unpublished. It's based on an idea that had been plaguing me ever since I was in college, which is that quantum mechanics can't be the ultimate picture of reality. It's too weird. But what would it be like if someone figures out the picture behind the picture? What, what kind of cosmic power could that give him? And given that he would just be a physicist, what would he do with it? So that kind of thinking was how most of these stories are written. There was some sort of a what if moment, uh, captured my imagination. So it was just a matter of going from there to find a character and inhabit it. Thank you very much, Charles. Next slide, please. Um, Dan, if you're here, I invite you to present. Okay. Oh, it's not letting me start my video. Um, that's under your control. Fred, you want to assist? Okay, there you go. Okay. Well, I, I fell in love with haiku in the 1990s, and um, I, I love that I have infinite freedom within those tight constraints. So this little book, Sweet Nothings, um, didn't start off as a book, but as a lot of my writing, just as a form of self-therapy. And A Sweet Nothings is a little book that is pithy, fun, and pleasurable about the nature of haiku and the philosophy of nothingness. And I try to combine those um, lovingly in a way that you know, can get myself and others to think, uh, but also enjoy and just relax where people can just pop in and out anytime and also ideally um, create their own sweet nothings, whatever that means to them. All right, thank you very much. Um, Dan, do you, did you wanna mention where you can find your book? Well, you can find it in the Martin Luther King Library, which is the best place to find it. And um, yeah, it's also on Amazon, but go, go to the library instead. Thank you for that promo. Next slide, please. Okay, Kathleen. Hello. Um, I've written a number of books, mostly about Venice, Italy, uh, but I wanted to tell you today about A Beautiful Woman in Venice. It's a collection of short biographies about 35 remarkable Venetian women. The stories actually span six centuries from the 1300s to the 1800s. A whole host of writers are represented here, Arcangela Tarabotti, Modesta Pozzo, and Lucrezia Maranella, who are some of the earliest proto-feminists in the world. And besides authors, there's composers Barbara Strozzi and Antonia Bembo, and the painter Rosalba Carriera, plus Elena Quanaro Piscopia, uh, the first woman in the world to earn a university degree. I've also included the poets Veronica Franco and Gaspara Stampa and boat race winner Maria Boscola. Uh, women often changed history or saved lives, like Giustina Rossi, who helped quell a rebellion, and Giovanna, whose paintings stopped the bubonic plague. With A Beautiful Woman in Venice, uh, I believe it's time to redefine women's beauty and celebrate their many achievements and contributions. Um, and you can find this book and my books on Amazon and my website. Thank you very much, Kathleen, for bringing us this very special book. Um, next slide, please. Robert. Hi, everyone. My name is Robert Ricardo Reese. Uh, I've written Monterey. It's a collection of poems and the book is a meditation on love um, as well as nature. Uh, the poems are simple celebrations of life in Monterey. Uh, they've been inspired 
from just being there as a resident um, and many visits as now a tourist. Um, there's everything from family, love relationships. Um, and I'll talk about the origin of the collection a bit later. Thank you. Oh, you can also find the book on Amazon. Thank you very much, Robert. All right, um, we are going to move ahead to our panel discussion. Um, and again, authors, if you have questions, I'm sorry, attendees, if you have questions or participants, if you have questions, please put that in the chat. Thank you. All right, our first question is, um, and some of you may have answered that a bit already, um, tell us how you happened to write this book. Did you start with a story, a character, or a situation? Open to all. I'll jump in there then, thank you. Uh, I wrote this book because it started with my love for Venice. Uh, I first went there in 1996 and I was so obsessed with the place that when I couldn't be in Venice, I would read about it. And after reading so much, um, I started to discover really interesting people in history. So I did a lot of research into Casanova. I actually wrote a book about him too. And then I really got interested in the women in Venice uh, whose stories really are not very uh, much shared. And so I just wanted to learn more about these women. And then I really wanted other people to know about them. So um, it, it was the love of Venice that led to the love of these particular women and wanting to share their stories. I can go next. Thank you. Yeah, Brad. Um, my stories are typically uh, prompted by a situation or an observation. So before I wrote stories, I used to, to keep a journal. I'm sure many authors probably started this way, writing down your thoughts and putting a lot of effort into it. And I realized no one's gonna wanna read this journal. I didn't even wanna read this, the damn thing. So I decided why not kind of flip it and take these observations and you know stage them on it with characters and places and a story arc and make it something that others can enjoy. So that was, my my journey. Thank you, Brad. Um, would yeah, anybody else I'm like to address? Too. Charles. Yeah, so uh, I, I did mention that um, for me, it's a, a lot of uh, a lot of these stories sort of spring from a question of what if such and such happens and uh, it can be something relatively uh, random and and unpredictable, like in the case of a uh, hummingbird that just came by and started hovering around me in my front patio one day, and that eventually turned into a story that made it into this book. And uh, another situation would be uh, uh, the issue of being a graduate student, respected in science fiction. What would happen if somebody tried to write one that you know was a bit more strictly observant of actual quantum mechanics or something like that. So there you go. Thank you. All righty. Yes. Oh, I so actually, um, I had half the collection already written uh, in grad school from 2009, 2012. I just put it on pause and actually I stopped writing for the last two years. Um, uh, my mother passed away of pancreatic cancer and uh, I just shut down. Um, and uh, I started teaching at a high school and my students, they Googled me and they found some of my publications and they asked me, can you write something new? And that broke my heart because um, I didn't know if I was ready yet. And I knew the next poem I had to write would be dedicated to my mother and would it be good enough? And um, I, I powered through it, did it. and. I finished the other half of the collection and just happened to happen as soon as we went to shelter in place. And that brought you to us. And it did. It did. Your mother will be a blessing through your book of poetry. Thank you. All right. Um, I have uh, another question. Um, what was one of the most surprising things you learned in creating the book that you are presenting now? Okay, I'll go first. <clears throat> so uh, as I mentioned, there are 27 stories in the collection. 
and uh, those are everywhere in length from flash to a to a, two novelettes, so ten thousand word novelettes. And the surprising thing that I learned in the course of writing all of these was how completely different one has to approach writing a story based on its length. I know that sounds obvious, but uh, I had to kind of teach it myself. So it's like taking a speedboat and zipping around, and then you can turn left and turn right very quickly, be very agile. And then you see a super tanker and you think, oh, that's just the same thing. I just got wheels and pedal and all that stuff. But of course it's completely different. And so trying to scale up was a very uh, surprising experience for me that uh, I like to think we, I figured it out, but it took a long time. Thank you, Brad. Charles. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I would say one of the most surprising things I learned uh, is that it's so much fun to create a completely new character, make somebody completely divorced from your life, exactly the opposite of the old adage that you should write what you know, and just see how far I see the life that you're creating can be. And it's, it's a fantastic therapy, at least for the author. I don't know how many readers agree with that. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Dan. Sure, I, I learned that just like silence potentially holds the space for all thoughts, all beliefs and non-beliefs, um, nothing holds the space potentially for anything. Um, the cover illustration, which I did, is a, is a Japanese Enso, and um, it's believed philosophically that this, you know, there's nothing inside the empty circle, and yet it could be anything, just like a pregnancy, or just like a planet, or just like possibilities. And so I love playing with those ideas, and it, it, it wakes me up, just like um, negativities can be positives, nothing can be everything. Thank you, Dan. Um, Kathleen. Uh, thank you. You know, um, I guess the thing for me that was, I, I don't want to say surprising only, but that's uh, alarming is that um, for all of the research that I did, um, I only found about 35 women to write about, and that's spanning about 500 years. So there's many, many, many books about Venice, but they all focus on men and men's history and men's place in the city. And so it was really difficult to find enough information about women. And uh, it, that shouldn't be surprising, um, but that's how it turned out. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, Robert. Um, I think what surprised me was after finishing the collection and getting it out there into the world is um, how many potential new readers there were and then there are. And I think that was wonderful. And you wouldn't, um, it's just coming from academia, uh, you, you know, you, you typecast who reads and who doesn't. And the beautiful surprise actually it happened last week when um, someone contacted me and he was like, you wrote about the monarch butterflies. I was like, yeah, yeah. It's like that in, where I'm from in Mexico, that's where they end their migration. And that spoke volumes to me and my family's migration into this country. And that blew me away because this person who got the book was not quote unquote, a reader, right? Um, so I think, you know, I, I wonder what, ha what would happen if we never wrote our projects. Somebody's world would be sorely lacking in, in the messages that um, you are all sending out. Um, another question, thank you, Robert. Another question to you all, um, and some of this has also been um, addressed. What life experience has shaped your, um, your writing most? Oh. Rap. Um, I think one major experience, I mentioned I was a, have, I've had a tech career and I've been in a lot of startups, either my own startups or working for other startups. And uh, the, the intensity of the teamwork, working together to uh, address a challenge or an opportunity, particularly when you wrap that inside of technology, it's 
very, very rich. Lots of interesting interactions that uh, can be can be teased out for for stories. So I, I, I go back to those memories a lot and uh, they're very rich. Thank you, Brent. Charles. Yeah, so uh, it's definitely the case that the graduate work I did in quantum field theory had a profound impact on my interest in where science is going and what kind of things are possible. I would have to put that up there as a primary, um, a primary experience. Another experience I had was that uh, my father was a, a huge science fiction and speculative fiction fan. He had a book of, he had a collection of thousands of books. He uh, just recently passed away and this book was dedicated to him. And uh, some of the amazing and, and mind opening stories that, that uh, I got to read from his collection were a pretty big part of my experience. Thank you, Charles. Dan. Yeah, for me, um, I'm partly inspired by the uncertainty of the world. Um, so I like, I like finding um, temporary solace in the concise poetry of haiku. And I also like playing with these philosophical concepts of, of nothingness, because ultimately, um, I think there is nothing. And yet here we are with, with everything, uh, everything in the physical world, but also everything in our um, imaginations. And just um, those ideas inspire me. Thank you, Dan. Kathleen. Uh, well, certainly travel um, has been a big inspiration to my writing. Um, that's been the focus of most of my work. Um, and education. I'm a teacher, so some of my writing is also about that. But, you know, I was thinking earlier when Martha Hernandez was talking about um, actually sitting down and completing a book, and probably one of the, the things that has uh, pushed me to always write is this quote I heard many, many years ago um, about applying, uh, writing is about applying the seat of the pants to the seat of the chair. And so I'm just a very persistent person who will sit down and do the work of writing. And, uh, you know, just I push myself and I, I want this, these stories to be shared with others. And so as sort of a life experience, that uh, persistence, that desire for others to hear these stories, um, those are really uh, things that push me forward. Thank you, Kathleen. With a well-worn pair of trousers and chair. Um, Robert. Um, I actually was born and raised in Korea my first 10 years. And my grandmother's house is actually right next to the North Korean border. So I would walk every day to the border. Um, and my imagination would go wild because maybe it's the entitlement of that blue passport where we can travel everywhere. I mean, not now, but I mean, before. Um, and here's this land that's cut off and this fence won't allow me go to go to another side. And my imagination just went wild and almost jumping off of what Dan was talking about, nothing is. Um, but there's something in how life exists and persists. Like it, there must be more. Um, and that I think as a young child just triggered my imagination. I've always had an active imagination because of that. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. Um, we have, despite what the timer says, the timer is not functioning and, and I'm sure you all noticed that. Um, we just have um, less than two minutes left. Is there a question from our, um, our audience, our attendees or from our other panelists? Okay, Maxine, that's my pup. She doesn't count. <laughs> okay, um, panelists, Brad, Charles, Dan, Kathleen, and Robert, thank you very much. We are going to move on to the next panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, welcome the folks on the Mystery and Sci-Fi panel. 
And I realize we just listened to two or three folks who have written in that genre. So we're not excluding you. Um, we're putting single stories together. So today we are going to be speaking with Enrique S. Flores, who wrote Cancun's Kingdom for Scene. And forgive me, Enrique, I can't see your subtitle. We're going to be meeting with Maya Catherine Bonhoff, who will be talking about the Antiquities Hunter, Tad, who was written by MD New, and Palmer Pickering, who wrote Moon Deeds. And then finally, but not last, we're going to speak with Valerie Estelle Frankel, who wrote the book Hunting for Meaning in the Mandalorian. So hang on a minute. <clears throat> um, Enrique, if you could please um, spotlight yourself, or not spotlight yourself, but put your, OK, there you are. Hang on a second. Yeah, no worries. So my name is Enrique Flores. And Kang King's Kingdom Foreseen, um, and the, the subtitle is um, based on the true story of tough love, and that's my third uh, published book. Um, it was published through, all three of them were published through Floricanto Press, um, and this one was different because the first two were kind of based a memoir, right, and a, and a workbook based on, on my life as well, and this one was a more of a combination of real life experiences um, my creativity and then some real kind of nightmares or dreams I had, um, very symbolic. So I integrated all three of them. And Kurt, I'm excited to, um, that it's, it's kind of taking a different direction, right? It's almost my dream is for it to become a, a film one day. So I have, you know, some meetings this week and it's being translated into Spanish currently as well. So let me read the log line um, in my, my, my take about 30 seconds. <laughs> Um, to do that. So it is a young father East attempts to live as a pacifist, but can no longer uh, restrain the beast within. Struggling with mental illness, which conjures uh, hor horrid visions of the future and secrets from his past lives, East enters into a desperate struggle to pre prepare his eight-year-old daughter, um, Kankin, before she embarks on the Shiro's journey uh, to recruit and lead a Latinx army of female warriors to fight the forces of evil and bring forth Gun King's kingdom. So that is uh, an, a gist of, of this kind of adventure story, kind of drama, kind of a thriller, and a lot of action as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now we have Maya Catherine Punhoff. Hello. I'm going to start right in with Gina. She's five foot two, gammon, and weighs 90 pounds in a soggy trench coat. The nickname Tinkerbell has followed her from high school. It's hard to imagine her riding a Harley named Boris or packing a baby blue 357 Magnum. She does both. She's Gina Miyoko, private eye. After a disastrous engagement and quitting the San Francisco police force, Gina has opened her own detective agency. Her usual cases involve suspicious spouses and workers' comp fraud, but when her best friend Rose picks up a stalker, she hires Gina to help her figure out who he works for. Both women quickly realize that Rose's work as an undercover agent for the National Park Service is more dangerous than they knew. The stalker is connected to a black market antiquities case Rose is investigating, and he's more than a stalker, he's a hitman. When Rose is gravely injured, Gina takes her place in an antiquity sting operation in Mexico and finds herself in a Mayan ruin deep in the wilds of Chiapas, pursued by a man she'd come to believe was a friend. Um, this book is available everywhere in hardback and trade paperback and ebook formats. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Okay, next we have um, MD New. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I am MD New. I write non romance LGBTQ plus stories with a focus on strong characters in exciting settings, most of which take place here in San Jose and the surrounding areas. My goal is to craft stories that anyone can relate to and enjoy. Uh, about Tad, when Tad pushes the boundaries of his duties too far, his angel wings are stripped and he is sent to New York City to live as a human. Lost and alone, he meets Doug and the two start a friendship that will last a lifetime and bring them to San Jose. But nothing is simple when you're dealing with a former angel of death and a drag queen. Could these two cause the world to end or will they manage to keep the future secure? This story was written to celebrate the lives of some friends who are no longer with us. 
all my works can be found anywhere books are sold, including my website. Thank you, MD. Next, we have Valerie Estelle Frankel. Hi. I am the author of, oh, no, wrong book. Oh, okay. Well, share what you have. Oh, I mean, I'm the next slide, but sure. Yeah, I'm that one. Okay. Hi. <laughs> I'm Valerie Estelle Frankel. I'm the author of Hunting for Meaning in the Mandalorian, and similarly, books on Hamilton, Game of Thrones, Doctor Who, Sherlock, Fourth Wave Feminism, Xena, She-Ra, Buffy, Wonder Woman, Captain Marvel, superheroines, basically whatever your fandom is, or if you're shopping for a fan, I've probably got a book for them. These are some guides and Easter eggs, mostly deeper analysis of things people have missed. Did you not know what the symbolism is of helmets, of color schemes, of gender dynamics in your favorite franchise? Well, my books will tell you. I've also got parodies on Harry Potter, Hobbit. I've got a book on uh, humorous Jewish children's stories for the holidays. It's all on Amazon Bookshop. And yes, I have signed copies on my website. Okay, now we have Pamela, sorry. Now we have Palmer Pickering. So I'm Palmer Pickering, author of Moon Deeds. Moon Deeds is a science fiction fantasy adult genre um, crossover. It's won five awards, so you can pick it up anywhere books, books are sold. It's, there's also an audiobook version. It, is, uh, it takes place in the near future in 2090 uh, when Earth is being taken over by a military dictatorship backed by alien technology. And the only thing that has shown to be a defense against this technology is magic. Uh, this is about two twins, Cassidy and Tor, who want to flee Earth and go to escape to the, a colony on the moon. And they have an idea to use an inheritance that they have, which is deeds to land on the moon. And they want to use this as a ticket off of Earth, but these deeds end up being more than they bargain for. There you go. Thank you, Palmer. It it's Thank the first you. of a series. Okay, bear with me while I find everybody, all my authors. Can you please project your image? Okay, hang on a second. Hmm. Uh, can one of the tech, other tech people give me a hand here, please? Not you. Okay. All right, so authors, thank you. Thank you for bearing with me. I learned I can only multitask three. Don't give me four things to do at a time because I lose it, sorry. But it's not about me, it's about you and these wonderful books that you have written. So the first question I have for you is, um, what attracted you to the genre that you wrote in or what made you to decide to write this genre? And if we could start with Enrique, let's go in alphabetical order. Okay, great, thank you. I think it was like a lot of writers, I'm assuming, are drawn or compelled to write. You know, um, I myself, I would probably, you know, use the example of Hitchcock, you know, where a lot of his movies were drawn, um, inspired, inspired by his uh, nighttime ter terrors, right, and nightmares. So, maybe every six months I would just feel compelled to write and I just start writing and writing and writing. I think one time I, I wrote for like, you know, I don't know how many hours straight flying to Hawaii um, and just had to get some of these ideas out. Um, so I think the imagery, the images, um, the sci-fi, you know, those type of just paranormal um, type of images came to me in my dreams and that's what set the, the context for all the rest of the story. 
and I forgot to mention, you can uh, purchase all three books on Amazon. So I forgot to mention that. Thank you. MD? Sure. So um, kind of like Enrique um, and just about everybody else, you you kind of get inspired by by something and just kind of catches you off um, off guard sometimes. It's uh, for me, it, it usually is a kind of a what if, you know, I've kind of always been fascinated with the whole what if this happened, what if that happened? And then all of a sudden you kind of get that little spark in your brain of, of the what if and and then you get these characters that pop in and start talking to you and start telling you their story. And so, yeah, for me, that was kind of kind of where my a lot of my inspiration comes from is kind of the whole what if and how, you know, how things could be a little bit different, how things could be um, changed or, or what would happen if something, you know, what happens if uh, Angel of Death is cast to Earth, right? I mean, that's kind of the premise of that whole story. So, yeah. Thank you. Maya. Um, well, I came into the writing life through science fiction, um, and I think it's, the, I love the thing with The Mandalorian, because I've written, this is not that Les Jedi, this is a but this is a, a novel, a Star Wars novel I did with Michael Reeves. Um, I started out writing science fiction in for Analog Magazine, and, but I, I came, the inspiration, I think, came, I'm a child of Star Trek, I'm a child of Ray Bradbury, and um, I love Ray Bradbury's ideas about SF because it's what I found with science fiction and he said is an effort to make reality believe make reality behave by pretending to look the other way it's the way we solve today's problems by putting them into a different place in the future and so to me it was like this idea of exploration that really kind of you know grabbed me um, and and I think my very first attempt to really put that on paper was um, overhearing a conversation about a California city that shall remain nameless that decided the best way to deal with homeless people was to truck them outside and dump them by the freeway. And I wrote a 19,000 word novella based on that and had no idea what to do with it. Um, but it really inspired me to want to look at that problem, a, a problem in society. So almost all of my science fiction and fantasy has to do with trying to solve to you know, make reality behave by pretending to look the other way. Um, I think that's just, you know, yeah. It, it's, and, and I was nodding along with what other people were saying because it was just like, yes, the dreams and the visions and the problems to solve. Thank you, Maya. Palmer. Oops. Oops. Can you unmute? There, we, there you go. We can't hear you. Try again. Can you hear me now? Gotcha. Okay, cool. Yeah, I also resonate with what other people are saying. I write uh, science fiction and fantasy because that's what I enjoy reading and what I've read my entire life. And some of my influences, I love the magical systems of Dune, uh, Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time and Robin Hobbs' Assassin's uh, Apprentice series. I love all the, the complex magical systems that they have used in their writing. Um, Carlos Castaneda is another one. In the, a lot of the magical systems in Moon Deeds in the series are shamanistic in nature. And I, I start in a very realistic, current day, modern setting, almost urban fantasy. And then I slowly like twist the reader's mind by bringing them into alternate realities, um, just sort of dragging them along into other ways of looking a reality and I love to play with that with how to sort of entrance the reader so that's what I love to do that's what I love to read so I'm trying to kind of sh add to the conversation and provide more more literature in that genre for people to enjoy thank you Valerie yeah clearly I am a fan of all of these franchises that I'm writing about because if I didn't like them I wouldn't spend a couple hundred pages analyzing what every little single thing meant in that episode or that movie yeah and as for reading i like those big 600 page epic fantasies that are book one of 20 yeah thank you thank you you are all inspiring me now okay next question where did you get the inspiration for this particular story and that he gets yeah, start with myself, I'm assuming. Um, the inspiration is my daughter. Um, she's eight years old. And Kankin 
is the Mayan zodiac for her um, birth month, uh, for her horoscope. So, Kankin. And it stands for Tree of Life, kind of wisdom. And um, her name, you know, the definition of her name is wisdom. So I wrote it for her when she's older. Um, I know she's been wanting to read it. So I allowed her to read, I think, three pages that were you know, kind of PG-13. Um, so she got super excited because she recognized a lot of the things in our current life. And she kind of looked at me like, wow, you use that. And I was like, yeah, I use that, you know, to inspire. So it's, it's a combination of real life. Um, and you don't know, right? You don't know uh, what is a dream, what happened in real life, and what was just my imagination. Um, it would have to kind of be a deeper dive for those that know me. Um, but my daughter was my inspiration. And and even though in the story, the dad is preparing uh, his daughter for post, right, his, his post death, it's kind of one of those type of um, intentions that if, you know, I were to not see 10 years down the line what would i want to convey those life lessons and for her to get to know her dad on a deeper level thank you md so for me what kind of inspired um the the book is a couple things one is uh representation um you know representation is so important to all communities and um, I can only speak for myself in this, but growing up, not seeing a lot of characters in books and TV shows that were like me or who I am or how I live my life, um, you know, you kind of, you, you miss that and you want to see it and you need to see it because you need to have some positive representation there. Um, in the particular case of Tad, um, the, the story was written actually to, uh, is it, it, kind of written to um, not memorialize, but I have some friends who passed away who happened to be uh, drag queens and I always consider that they're kind of um, guardian angels. And so it was kind of just a way to, to honor them and who they were and kind of not let who they are uh, vanish and disappear. So they're kind of reflected there in the stories. And, you know, for me, I kind of hope that it's something that they would all appreciate and, uh, and enjoy. So that was kind of where I was going with that. It's, you know, it's a, it's a fun story, but it's also got some poignant points too, so. Thank you, MD. Maya, what was your inspiration? Um, for this one, I love to read mysteries. I love to write science fiction and fantasy and magical realism and whatever happens to pop into my head. But when I, when I pick up a book to read, I most often pick up a mystery novel. And I decided I wanted to write um, partly because I have read so many novels about broken female detectives. You know, they're substance abusers, they're from abusive relationships and all this stuff, and they're all broken people. And I wanted to write about a, a, a female detective who wasn't broken. So I kind of developed the character first. And then, um, then I, I found that my love of, of archaeology, I was kind of looking for cases for her to, to take on. Um, my love of archaeology led me to read a, an article in Smithsonian about a National Park Service undercover agent. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. You know, I didn't have you know, no idea these people existed. And I was so fascinated by her story that I based the novel, The Antiquities Hunter, kind of around the story of this woman who was a National Park Service um, ranger, undercover agent, who happens to be um, my hero, my heroine's best friend, um, Rose. And she's, she's actually, she's Native American. Um, my detective is um, half Japanese and half Russian American. So um, I, I just got really inspired by what I wasn't seeing, what I wanted to read myself and um, my love of archeology. span Thank you. Thank you, Palmer. Yeah. So, you. Yeah, so uh, Moon Deeds was actually inspired by a gag gift that I got uh, one Christmas. My brother gave everyone in the family um, deeds to land on the moon like I should have, I should get them out of my cabinet, you know, parchments with, you know, the coordinates that I own and the map showing, you know, what quadrant, my, you know, where I, I literally potentially own land on the moon because no, no international organization has actually claimed the moon. So I could actually myself, Palmer Pickering, own land on the moon right now. And so I did sort of like what MD got to, which is a what if. Well, what if these actually are legit moon deeds? And what if as I pass them down through the generations, they become really, really important. 
And then I, my imagination went off and I tried to, and I thought of a scenario where these deeds would actually be critical um, to the descendants in my family and that they would actually need them in order to survive. So that was the basis of Moon Deeds. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Right. I was at a party and somebody said, I don't understand what happened at the end of that movie. It got all weird and symbolic. And I said, oh, well, what was happening was, and I launched into this like 10 minute lecture on what everything symbolized and suggested and meant on a deeper level. And when I stopped, everyone was staring. And I said, um, I'm an English major. <laughs> and then I tried doing this with books. I tried doing, oh, you didn't get the symbolism of one of them having a pink dress and one of them having a green dress. Okay, let's talk about that. And my first few books on Hunger Games and Game of Thrones and Buffy sold really well. So now whenever I see any of these, I just ask, do I have a book there? Thank you. All really great reasons. Um, we did have a question from the audience, which I'm not going to ask you to answer right now. But if you could put your answer in the chat, then everybody could read it as we go along. One final question for you all in a couple of words, could you say what technologies have influenced your story or have been helpful for sharing your story? Enrique? Yeah, so for myself, um, movies, right? Movies, um, my my hope is that my my book reads like a movie, you know, the, the visualness of it and being able to talk to some you know, Hollywood people right now about maybe making that a reality. So it's very exciting. Um, and as I, as I reread the book, I just, I see the images uh, kind of come to life. So I'm, I'm just really excited about it. Thank you. MD? Um, I would say pretty much all technology, uh, you know, laptops, smartphones. I mean, anything tech related, especially where I live here in Silicon Valley, it, it has all impacted everything that I write. I mean, I just, it, it's, everywhere it's pervasive so yeah it's every it affects everything that i write and it affects how i market books and how i get the word out to people thank you maya yeah i think uh the internet and an iphone um and i i was i used to work in software development and did um, research online back when you had the you know the acoustic modem and the whole thing and there was this thing called dialogue which was like a scientific internet and I remember having a debate with a, a colleague uh, who couldn't believe that the World Wide Web would ever be useful for anything. And I was absolutely gobsmacked and tried to explain to him that doing research for the stories that I wrote was absolutely crucial. And the internet made it so much more easy to find the books, you know, even if it was a question of wanted a book, find a book I wanted, find the information I wanted. Thank um, you, Maya. Yeah. Thank you. Palmer. Um, yeah, so I, I'm in high tech also. I'm an innovation manager at HP and I scout startups for new technologies. Uh, and Moon Deeds is a combo sci-fi fantasy. And there's a lot of hard science actually in this. Um, the research, I did extensive research on the moon. So basically everything about the moon is scientifically accurate except for gravity. I made a magical gravity system. Even faster than light travel is based on some theories, albeit you know kind of far out theories, but they are actual potentially real theory. So uh, there's hard science fiction in there, did a lot of research. That's part of the fun of writing science fiction for me. Thank you, and Valerie. Also. 10 seconds. Can you? This year, yeah. online conventions have been amazing and delightful. Hit me up for a list. Thank you, everybody. I'm so looking forward to reading your books. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next slide, please. Thank you. Our next panel um, is entitled San Jose's Stories. Um, with us, we have Kathy, Cassie Kiefer, um, Secret San Jose, A Guide to the Weird, Wonderful, and Obscure, Gary Singh, Silicon Alleys, and Jenny Clendenen, Mine, Tom Leggett, Mozart in the Garden. Um, Gary, tell us about your book. Thank you. Uh, it's great to see so many. I'm oh, sorry. I thought you said Gary. Go ahead. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Cassie. Yeah, Cassie. 
I did say Gary, but Cassie, please. Okay, okay, sorry about that. <laughs> but yeah, um, I'm Cassie Kuiper, uh, and I'm here to talk about my book, A Secret San Jose, A Guide to the Weird, Wonderful, and Obscure. Uh, Secret San Jose is an unconventional travel guidebook uh, featuring more than 85 unique stories about our community, uh, places to visit, and things to do. Um, in addition to some quirky and unusual stories, or uh, the weird, um, I tried to share stories that tell how our community came to be and uh, highlight the contributions of people and organizations uh, who aren't usually recognized. Um, when I took on this project, um, I couldn't have uh, expected that the world this book would launch into this fall uh, with the pandemic, uh, California's worst fire season ever, and everything else uh, that's been going on this year. Uh, but frankly, the book couldn't have come out uh, at a better time. Uh, a lot of the stories um, I included in here are pegged to places that you can visit and appreciate safely outdoors. And in the midst of this very challenging year, a lot of us are staying home uh, more than usual. So it's a good time to appreciate our local community. Uh, you can find it in all of our local independent bookstores, um, including Recycled Books, Books Inc. and Hickleby. So look for it there or secretsanjose.com. Thank you very much, Cassie. All right, Gary, take it away. Thank you. Um, about 15 years ago, uh, the editors of Metro, the alternative weekly newspaper in the South Bay, uh, gave me my own column in the paper every week to write about the underbelly of San Jose from a bent perspective that only a native wacko could possibly do. And uh, that was April of 2005. I thought it would last maybe about four or five months. Uh, turns out it lasted about 15 years, and I still write that page every single week in the paper. Um, and and since the book and since many people have asked me to do an anthology of greatest hits, you know, over the last 15 years, that's generally exactly what I just did last spring. Uh, in this book, you have almost 300 columns arranged chronologically from 2005 all the way up until last April. And uh, you don't need to read it front to back. You can jump in wherever you want. It's great uh, short reading. You know, there's all sorts of uh, stuff in the index and the table of contents. You can get it at any book, any bookstore in the world can order it however, they, whenever you want, or it's on Amazon or indie bookstores. Thank you very much, Gary. Looking forward to reading that. Uh, next, we have Jenny. Tell us about your book. Jenny, you're muted. Okay, great. I am Jenny Clendenin. Mine is the story of Maria Zacarias Bernal de Berriessa, a Spanish matriarch of early San Jose whose family helped settle the entire Bay Area. For 20 years before I heard of Zacarias, I'd been drawn to a creek on her land in East Amadan Valley. It was the place that meant the most to me during the worst 10 years of my life and I'd filled many journals there. And when I found out who had once owned that land and what had happened to her and her family there in the mid 1800s, I understood why that creek had been speaking to me. And I knew this was history every Californian should know. So it's been a privilege to learn and write about this remarkable, courageous woman. Mine is Maria Zacharias's story and in many ways mine. And it's available at Recycled Books on the Alameda, Booksmart in Morgan Hill, Bookshop Santa Cruz, Amazon, and the San Jose State Library. And Gary wrote a lovely review of it in Metro. Thank you, Gary. Thank you very much. And it is also available at the San Jose Public Library. Thank you, Jenny. Next slide, please. Tom, would you please present? Mozart in the garden. Tom? Yes, are we good? My machine was not cooperating. I'm sorry. Okay, let's get your camera on. Okay. Is, is the camera still on? Now yes. it is. Okay, great. Thank you. I was born in a Campbell, California bordello to an American Indian girl. She was impoverished. I spent most of my childhood spending a week at alone, seeing no people in my house. I don't consider myself to be a victim because when I was 11, I learned that three hours of sweeping floors, cleaning toilets, pulling weeds or mowing lawns would buy a cheeseburger fries and strawberry mulch. The biggest thing that working hard did for me is it brought me around lots of interesting people. Faye Wolf, the 
widow of Carl Wolf, the architect of so many things that his father took credit for here in the Valley, a now famous printer named Max Gosling who ran a print shop and a 33 foot Spartan trailer and lived in it. Uh, hard work has been my savior and it was a pleasure to mention Faye Wolf's name. That was the original title. <laughs> Just in time, Tom. Thank you very much. Um, for all of our panelists, next, thank you. Um, I ask you, what prompted you to use San Jose as a backdrop in your work and to take the pathway that you chose in the telling of your tale? Um, Cassie, why don't you begin? Sure. Um, so in my case, uh, the publisher <laughs> decided that they wanted to feature San Jose, uh, and they uh, found me uh, through a referral. Um, the book is one of a series of other secret city uh, books that they've done around the country, including Secret San Francisco. Uh, so they all follow the same format. Um, but I do think, um, to my publisher's credit, they saw there was an opportunity uh, to share some of our local stories um, in this way, as an easy to flip through a travel guidebook. Uh, the major travel guidebook companies like Moon and Lonely Planet and such, um, and the broader travel industry um, have never really uh, pegged San Jose as a destination uh, worthy of exploration on its own. Um, so I'm glad um, our, my publisher realized we do have a community of people uh, here across the Bay Area um, that are eager, eager to learn about the South Bay. Um, and I am sure that um, the other folks here in this panel would agree, uh, people here in San Jose are really excited uh, to see our community celebrated in writing. Um, we all live here and we love it uh, most of the time. Uh, and uh, we get excited when we see somebody else um, recognizing it and giving it value as a place. Thank you, Cassie. Gary. Uh, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> what prompted you to use San Jose as a backdrop, in your case, uh, as uh, functioning for all of your stories in your work and to take the pathway that you chose in the telling of your tale. Uh, well, I'm I'm born and raised here. I'm, my mom I'm my mom went to San Jose State. My grandmother went to San Jose State. I went to San Jose State. Um, so, um, and I never left. So um, I did want to leave for the last 25 years. I've wanted to leave, but <laughs> but um, it turned out that uh, they gave me a call on 15 years ago, and I didn't think it would last that long. And um, not everything in this book is celebrating San Jose. Some of it is trashing everything that San Jose is all about, you know, for um, in a in a appreciative way. I mean, <laughs> um, you know, but um, San Jose is my hometown, and as long as I'm still living here, um, I'm going to write about it, you know. And um, the you know, it's more like. Um, in my case, work, there's no separation, but my, my work and my life and my writing and my job is all the same thing. There's no separate thing. I don't have a day job. I've been a freelance independent writer for 20 years, you know, um, and writing is what I am. You know, I pretty much failed at everything else. So this is it. This is what I do. Gary, we are so happy that you have continued as a writer and we're very happy that you are here. Thank you. Jenny. You're muted. Kenny? Thanks, guys. <laughs> what prompted me to write about San Jose was actually the land itself. I had been drawn to this creek in Eastern Almaden Valley for a long time for personal reasons. And I had spent an awful lot of time there immersed in nature and in my own stories that were going on in my own midlife. And um, it really was, when I went looking for a thesis topic for my master's at, at San Jose State, in creative nonfiction. And I learned about this woman who had lived exactly where I had been walking all these years. And her story was so tragic and so newsworthy um, that it, it just begged to be told. It was not my choice to specifically to go write about San Jose, but she came calling and her land had been calling long before that. So it was a very easy, um, it was very the easy thing to decide. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, Tom. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to do a shout out to Gary. I think that we were on our way to being closer friends when uh, the COVID thing hit and I closed the doors uh, on seeing anybody, but thank you for writing for all these years. Thank you for doing a story mm -hmm. on me. And um, most of all, thank you for being a good writer. 
because uh, bad writers are intolerable. <laughs> at, at any rate, uh, I like to say it was an accident of birth that I was born in San Jose area, but it's no accident that I still live here 70 years later. Uh, this story was set here because that's where I lived it. Uh, I love San Jose. I'm like Gary. I think our habit of naming edifices after living people in San Jose and certain things like that are bad. But I love this town for all its faults. And um, I think we got the best mayor in America. So uh, I'm not ready to leave yet, Gary. But if you leave, I might be gone too. So I... I wrote the book about San Jose because that's where the events transpired. Thank you, everybody. Um, beautiful friendships um, are going to be fostered, I'm sure, through, um, through our gathering. All right, next question. And uh, attendees, if you have any questions, uh, please throw that in the chat. Otherwise, I'm going ahead. Of all that you have written in your featured local lit presentation, what story, scene, or lesson in this book stays foremost in your thoughts and that you hope will remain in the minds of your readers? Let's just go to Cassie. Sure. Um, well, uh, San Jose has a long history of activism. Uh, so probably uh, the work of the activists and uh, the diverse struggles of the people that build our community are the stories that I uh, care most about. Uh, so people like Cesar Chavez, uh, who found his calling as a community organizer, uh, going door to door and registering people to vote uh, right here um, on the east side of San Jose. Um, and the immigrant uh, rights struggles, um, which date back to, you know, even when, uh, you know, San Jose's early Chinatowns uh, were targeted again and again uh, with rape, racist hatred and violence. Um, and then later Japanese American families um, interned during World War II. Um, and there are people like uh, Clara Foltz, uh, who was the first female uh, attorney on the West Coast who fo fought for the w uh, women to get the right to vote um, and for the right to practice law here in California, and also to protect the legal rights of the poor. Uh, so there's a lot of history here that I don't think a lot of people know about um, that I think should humble and inspire us. Thank you, Cassie. Gary? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think... Um... What I've learned the most is, you know, well, one, as a writer, if you just never give up, I think that's the best advice I would give to anyone else in the world. People are always asking me, or especially students are always asking me, you know, what do you, what's your advice? And, you know, and I could, I could joke around and say stuff like, well, the first 15 years are the worst. Okay. So just keep going. Okay. You know, but um, if you just never give up and, and, keep, and you do keep going, then, you know, good things can always happen, okay? You know, I mean, when they first gave me this column, I was a totally different person, you know? Um, I was more of a, uh, but the writing was, this is one of the reasons why everything is in the book chronologically, okay? You know, um, the columns at the beginning, some of them were so embarrassing, I couldn't even put them in the book. They were so bad compared to the, the, the current day that I just couldn't deal with it, you know? And um, I was a different person then, I was much more of a, a bar fly kind of person and I, the writing was a little saucier and snottier and more contrarian you know and uh, nowadays are you guys closed now um charles could you please oh, mute I see. Yourself? Uh, I don't have to change i was going to use a credit card can charles I can you mute yourself please so, uh, i'm out of the system right now because my brain yeah. anyway um so nowadays, it's a, the writing is a lot deeper. The writing has grown. I've grown as a person. And if I had just quit writing this column and left San Jose, then I probably wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have discovered all of that the way that I did discover it. So for me, writing is life. Like I said, nothing is separate. And I've really, really grown as a person. And I think anybody else can do that too if you just keep writing and you know, just don't give up and keep at it, no matter how horrible or miserable or depressing it gets. And no matter how much professional envy and jealousy you have at everybody else's success, you know, just keep going. And, you know, I'm the same way. I'm always angry that somebody else is more famous than I am, you know, you know, just, if you just keep going, don't give up and you'll eventually find some improvements somewhere. Thank you, Gary. You are a local hero. Never forget that. Jenny, can well, you answer the question? Yes, I think that um, the lesson that I would like readers to take away or the, the memory, the, the what to do, is to just be aware that there is unwritten history under your feet wherever you go. 
that you don't have to be in a museum or a library or with a docent to be on top of layers and layers and layers of very newsworthy, fascinating lore um, that's relevant and important. Every layer is important in history today. The more we know about what happened before um, at the micro level and larger stories, the more informed we are about what is and could be. And um, so I would say, wherever you go, um, watch out for the, the odd building or the non-native tree and listen for the voices that speak to your heart and take the time to find out what happened there. For me, there was a lot of anxiety and awkwardness about writing about a long dead woman of another culture. Um, even before this year, I felt very self-conscious about that. But her story really begged to be told and I felt it was mine to tell because I had spent so much time on that land and I knew it so well. And it was seemed far more than a coincidence when I found out who had been there with me all along, so to speak. And I think that that opportunity is there for anyone who just pays attention and follows up, whether you write about it or just read about it and, and educate yourself, it's, it's valuable. Thank you, Jenny, as you're speaking, I, I get chills uh, of your connection. Tom, can you uh, respond to the question, please? Yes. Um, for me, being born in a bordello, it almost seems curious that, that prostitutes have been a recurring theme in my life. Faye Wolf was a former prostitute who married a rich man, and then she ended up poor. And... I later was head cook in one bordello and probably in another local place, which was one, two. And it just, the life of these women, the sex workers in my family, um, it's a story that's never told. The women are stigmatized. I never patronized prostitutes, but I sure ended up talking to a lot of them. And it's, it's the underside and how they're blamed. And Faye Wolf used to say that people, Carl Wolf, the, the, the son of Frank Dulles Wolf, uh, who did most of Dulles Wolf's great work, Faye used to say that everybody blamed her for horning in on the fortune, but after Carl died, nobody wanted her debts. Nobody wanted Carl's debts. And I, I think that we don't seek out the underside of life, Gary Singh, but if you're drawn to it, I think we can't flinch from it and we need to celebrate that these are people too and to think a little harder before we stigmatize. And I think that's what my book is about. Unwanted children, prostitutes, crushed dreams, that sort of thing. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. Okay, we have a very, very brief period of time left. You can see that the timer hasn't been functioning. So um, I'm going to ask this and, and if you can respond um, in one or two sentences and very quickly. So swallow that, uh, that swig of caffeine. Okay, what research did you do to write this book and how long did it take you to finally say, the end, my work is complete? Cassie. Sure, well, uh, thank you to our libraries. <laughs> I read everything that I could read about San Jose. Um, I spent a lot of time in the California room at the main library um, and the uh, archives at uh, History San Jose, uh, Gary's column, uh, everything else that every, anyone has ever written about San Jose, <laughs> I tried to read. And I talked to everyone uh, that I could uh, for more than a year, um, asking them what are the places here that you love um, that you don't think people talk about enough. Thank you, Cassie. Gary. Uh, it took me 15 years to write the book, obviously, but, um, but um, I would just say that, you know, I, I'm going to answer that with a, a different answer. I mean, you know, there's so many people that think that there's nothing to write about in San Jose. Okay. You know, if I go to Santa Clara, people say there's nothing to write about in San Jose. Okay. You know, so, I mean, you know, people, you know, and these four books, I mean, I mean, the other three books, okay, I mean, besides mine, the other three books are, will tell you so much about San Jose that you'd never even have heard of before, you know, I mean, I mean, and this is a great, I mean, I'm honored to be on this, this, this panel right here, because this is these, this is a collection of stuff, these four books that will tell you that San Jose is a real city, it just, it just because it's not, 
you know, Manhattan or San Francisco or something, that there's enough matrices of identities and all sorts of crazy stuff going on here. History, you know, current day, past day, present day, all sorts of stuff that all kind of contract and expand into one matrix of stuff that you can write about if you live here, you know, and, and this, the city is worth writing about. That's what this group of people are telling you right now. Thank you very much, Gary. Yep, I never thought that I would end up in San Jose, but I'm very happy to be here. And otherwise I wouldn't have met all of you. Jenny. There we go. Well, first I wanna say thank you again, Gary. Your, your work um, has already um, helped mine a great deal and it is an honor to be on this panel with you and Cassie and Tom. So I want to echo that. Um, I spent uh, about seven years in libraries and museums, cultural organizations, and rich conversations with genealogists and descendants. Paul Burnell, who is the official historian of San Jose, is a descendant of Maria Zacharias Burnell de Berriese, and was extraordinarily helpful. So, and has been all along. So that was a huge plus as well. And I stopped writing only when I realized that I could write this book forever. I could research forever. I would never find the bottom of the story. Um, I didn't want to stop till I found a picture of her, but I, I knew that could take another few years and I just wanted to get it out there. And I'm so glad I did. The timing was really quite perfect given events of this year. So um, anyway, yeah. Thank you, Jenny. Tom, wrap it up on this panel. I wrote this book because I got suckered. A friend of mine has a daughter who's a screenwriter and she says, write a screenplay for me. I wrote it, it's called Faye Wolf. This was, so I wrote a screenplay base that would stand alone as a, what I call the true novella, because it is true, but it reads like a novel. So I got conned. That's why I wrote the book. I knew I was going to get conned before I wrote the book. Uh, the screenplay cost me $4,000. It was horrible. They ruined this story, but I ended up with this really fine little book. Um, and um, Gary Singh will tell you that uh, writing is never a straight line. And if you long, long as you end up with the story and a good story that's well written, you don't care if you got conned along, along the way. All right, beautiful, beautiful, Tom. You know, um, you are all here um, connected and um, may the force be with you that this, um, this connection grows stronger through time. Cassie, Gary, Jenny, Tom, thank you very much. And we are going to move on to our next panel. Thank you all. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Dana, and I have the honor of introducing the authors and their amazing books in our last panel, which is, um, which is entitled, or I'm sorry, titled Triumphs. We'll be hearing from Claudia Melinda Salinas and about her book, A Fighting Chance, Luann Oleas with her book, Flying Blind, A Crop Duster Story, Martha Engber and, and her book, Winter Light, and last but not least, Robert Mosey Alexander, Can't Let Nobody Ride My Bike, an Oakland Narrative and Hip Hop Soundtrack. So I'm also running the PowerPoint today, so bear with me as I try to, to uh, multitask here. There might be slight delays in things. All right, so first off, we'll listen to Claudia Melinda Salinas as she tells us about her book, A Fighting Chance. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. My name again is Claudia Melendez. Fighting Chance is a coming of age story that takes place in Salinas, the salad bowl of the United States of America. Miguel Angel is a 17 year old child of immigrants who's training hard to reach his dream of becoming a prize fighter. Miguel Angel has to contend not just with his family's lack of financial means and his need to balance high school work with high school with work but he also desperate, he's also desperate to spend time with, with a girl he's falling in love with, the super wealthy Brittany who lives on the other side of Monterey County. He's also being pulled by his childhood friend, a young guy who's getting deeper and deeper into the gang lifestyle and is threatening to derail Miguel Angel's dreams. Uh, 
Although this is a story of fiction, it is based in true, on true events in Salinas when budget shortfalls threaten to close local beloved libraries and the community centers that serve as refuge to thousands of working class kids. The book is available in the San Jose Public Library, artepublicopress.com and bookshop.org. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. One moment while I stop the timer. Okay. And next, we'll hear from Luann Olias, Flying Blind, A Crop Duster Story. Luann, can we please hear from you? Hi. Thank you for sharing your Sunday with me, all of our panelists. Uh, and my book is called Flying Blind, is a Crop Duster Story. It's available on Amazon in print and ebook, or it, you can also get the print book at Barnes and Nobles and uh, of course the San Jose Library. And it's a story of Tony who's a crop duster and he's fine as long as he stays in the air, but he's a mess on the ground. And particularly when it comes to his relationships. The setting is Steinbeck, Salinas Valley. And if you're from the San Jose area, you're probably familiar with a lot of the places that are mentioned in the book. Uh, Castroville, Moss Landing, Salinas, uh, Royal Seco, King City. But uh, the story starts actually in Texas where Tony loses his seat as a crop duster there for having an affair with the boss's wife. And he returns quickly to California, but can't find a job. All right, thank you so much, Luann. Next we have Martha Engber, Winter Light. Can we hear from you, please, Martha? Yes, hello. Um, my name is Martha Engber, and thank you for uh, having me this afternoon. Uh, Winter Light is the story of 15-year-old Mary Donahue of suburban Chicago, a kid on the cusp of failure uh, during the brutal blizzard winter of 1978-79, the end of a hard luck, hard rock era sunk in the cynical aftermath of the Vietnam War. The language of Winter Light is simple and stark as Mary's internal landscape. Though a smart, beautiful kid, she's a motherless girl raised by an uneducated alcoholic father within an extended family of alcoholics and addicts. Aware that she's sinking, she's desperate to save herself and so reaches out to an unlikely source, Kathleen, a nice normal kid from English class. Though initially bleak, this story of redemption combines literary with historical fiction and is aimed at anyone who loves classics such as To Kill a Mockingbird and Catch Her in the Rye, where youth struggle at the abyss of a brutal adult world. It's available in print, Kindle, and ebook on Amazon and all major online bookstores. Thanks so much, Martha. All right. And can we now hear, please, from Robert Mosi Alexander? Can't let nobody ride my bike. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Robert Alexander. And Can't Let Nobody Ride My Bike is a coming of age story of how a young black boy found his calling as a rider during the crack epidemic of the 1980s. Oakland is broken up into zones. From 71st, from 71st Ave to 79th is the 700 zone and so on. So Ronald Anderson and his friends, they refer to themselves as the 700 bike crew. To Ronald and his friends, their bikes are their cars. So can't let nobody ride my bike was a saying that meant my bike is my territory. Either they got it for Christmas or they got it for their birthday. And if you let someone ride it, it might not come back. You may not never see it again. So Ronald is a young man who is struggling to find his way as an intelligent young black man growing up fast in East Oakland, California, with one foot in the streets and one foot in academics. Ronald and his group of friends must figure out ways to avoid, to avoid the entrapments of Oakland and the street life the neighborhood that they grew up in. So together they must navigate bullies, drugs, sex, and violence. The streets of Oakland put Ronald and his friends to the test. My book is available on hoodtireeducation.com as well as Amazon. Thank you so much, Robert. All right, now we'll move into the panel portion. Let's advance our slide here. All right. Get the timer going here. All right, the first question I have for our panelists is, uh, where did you get your inspiration for this story and work? And I'll start with Robert. 
Well, I got my inspiration from just my childhood. I, I had an amazing childhood and it shaped me. Um, my community was, was rich with, um, it's a tight knit community that was just rich with, with folks that looked after each other. Um, my mother was a librarian. My, my father, my father was a writer. Um, and the block that I grew up in in East Oakland, they, they just showed me a lot of love. So this was my tribute to not only Oakland, the culture, my friends that I grew up with and the neighborhood that I grew up in. Um, I wanted to write this book for, you know, African-American boys and, and men that, that might have been having identity issues in terms of having one foot in academics and, and one foot in the community um, or low socioeconomic communities, AKA the ghetto, the hood. So this was kind of um, my way of just leaving something behind. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. Martha, where did you your story? Uh, I've loved uh, listening to Robert's story, so it's very similar. Uh, I went to a huge um, public uh, school in suburban Chicago, uh, and there were about a thousand kids per class, uh, freshmen, a thousand kids, freshmen, sophomore, so forth. Um, and it was based primarily on observations. I too was really fortunate to have a really good, strong um, childhood and upbringing. But uh, it, the thing about coming of age books that is so poignant is that you begin to see the problems around you, the kids who are really having trouble and you wonder what, what's going on with them. And so the book is an exploration of that. I wondered why can't they just pull themselves up to, by their bootstraps and the, the book, uh, my character, Mary Donahue, taught me why. All right. Thank you so much, Martha. Luann, can we please hear from you how you are the inspiration, where you drew the inspiration for your work? Um, I, I live in, this, in the Salinas Valley, and um, I had always heard the adage that you should write what you know. And so I was, work, I was working at that time as a locksmith and I didn't really think I could put together a whole novel about that. But my husband worked as a crop duster for 16 years. And so I, I used a lot of that information when we would come home at night and we would compare stories. I would say something like, well, I, I had to get the keys out of a car for a drunk who wouldn't pay me. And he would say, well, we were waiting for the wind. And so we took the airplane and we, we took a bunch of baggies and we filled them with flour. And then we took the door off the airplane and we flew out over the Monterey Bay and we, we flower bombed whales. Or I took up a bunch of uh, sky jumpers and they jumped out of the airplane. And as they were on their way down, a, a helicopter came underneath them and they all were scrambling to get out of the way of the rotors. And, he would come home with these stories and I was thinking, you know, that's a heck of a lot better than, you know, having to remake a key over and over again for the local pimp or something. So I went with that as my inspiration. Thank you. Claudia, what was your inspiration for your story? I've been a newspaper, I was a newspaper reporter back in 2004 and five when Salinas was having trouble with their budget. And one of the solutions that was um, proposed was to close uh, libraries and uh, also do some shifting around community centers. And a lot of the reporting I was doing was reporting that was narrating what the adults were doing, right? They were trying to uh, rearrange the budget and where can we find the money, et cetera, et cetera. And it occurred to me that nobody was asking the young people in the area, especially the Latinos who were the ones who are going to be suffering the most uh, from the community centers being closed, asking them, what, what is, um, how is this going to affect you? So that was my response, writing a novel that had at its center, the story of a young uh, Latino who was going to be deeply affected by the closure of a uh, local boxing club. So that was the impetus behind the story. Great, thank you so much. And I'd like to remind our participants, if you have questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll certainly be happy to ask our authors your questions. My second question, and whoever would like to can just jump in with, uh, with answers on this one, we'll just do it popcorn style. What life experience has shaped your writing the most? Go ahead and jump in. 
Uh, my sixth grade teacher had my class uh, journaling and, and that meant a lot to me. It was the first time that I journaled and she also introduced uh, poetry to us, poetry stanzas. Uh, later on, I, I got introduced to college prep programs like Upward Bound, Project Seed and Mesa. And, you know, I took creative writing classes within those programs. So that that further kind of piqued my, my development as a writer. My, my, I mentioned earlier that my mom was a librarian, so we kept we kept books in the house. We had a, a library, and I remember having being the only family in our community that had an Encyclopedia Britannica set. So my friends would come over to my house and ask to borrow, you know, different parts of the Encyclopedia for like projects. So I became like a you know my family became like a resource to my neighborhood in East Oakland, um, and I felt like. Just, I've been doing college counseling. I'm a college advisor at De Anza College. I've been doing it for 15 years. And just got to thinking like, I have so much more to offer. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start putting my work out there. Um, Can't Let Nobody Ride My Bike uh, was my first book, but I've also written um, a second book called She Hit Me First that deals with uh, bullying and how a young girl, how a young African-American girl um, actually learned hitting through her mom the spankings that she was giving from her mom so just um the life experiences um they, they definitely shaped my writing all right thanks so much anybody else want to talk about a life experience that shaped their writing i think my if it's okay if i jump in is that my uh journalism background i got a degree in journalism and it uh further um uh develop my skill of observation as well as finding out why. And I think that's one of the biggest um, attributes that a writer or skills that a writer could have is to keep asking why until you actually understand it. Not understand it a little bit, but understand it thoroughly um, because that's what you can um, bring to your, um, your reading public is a um, ability to look at everything that leads to a, a difficult situation for people. And then they will really understand. All right, thank you so much. Anyone else? What life experience has shaped your writing? I can go next. Uh, the, I definitely grew up reading a, as much as I could. We didn't have a lot of books in the home where I grew up. I grew up in Mexico, but, um, but I just really loved reading as much as I could. And I also love writing. I didn't think I had a lot of a good um, imagination to create stories. And I realized later that it's just through observation that you create those stories. And so that was, those were uh, two very important for me. Also my experience as a woman of color in this country, um, I do believe it's very important that more people of color write stories because um, a lot of what's out there is not written for or Latinos or, or Black Americans or Native Americans. And I feel like I have an obligation. I have this gift. I have this. So I have an obligation to put our stories out there for more people to see how rich, beautiful our culture is. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Luann, would you like to talk about life experience that shaped your writing? Sure. Um, probably started when I was a kid and uh, my Irish grandma would always read to me and we'd read the newspaper in bed. And I just love that. She taught me to read very early. And um, when I was in about the <laughs> third grade, I, I always wrote, I never thought anything about it, but one of my teachers took a poem and got it published in Playmate magazine. And that kind of turned me on to the idea, put the stars in my eyes. But uh, I think it was probably working at the Salinas California newspaper that uh, really kind of sealed the deal. I had taken a feature story on writing about Amtrak and I rode down the length of the valley. And when I got to San Luis Obispo, I was supposed to turn around and come back. And because the train, uh, the Amtrak people knew that I was writing for a newspaper, they actually held the other train for me to get on and come back. And, and you know, I think the other passengers weren't that happy. I had to walk the length of the train, but it made me feel good. And I thought, well, this, this is what writing should be. This is the kind of kudos you should get. So that's how it started for me. Wonderful. Thanks so much. 
And I haven't seen any questions from the audience yet, so I'll go on with my last question for all of you. And the popcorn method worked out well before, so we'll do that one again. Uh, what do you hope readers will take away from your writing? I could go first. Okay. Um, I, I think when I write a story, every story is about healing in some way. That's part of the character arc. And uh, I hope when people read my book, they can learn from Tony's experiences, how he tried to solve his problems and what, what made a difference for him. Um, it started when he was actually took this interim job as a flight instructor and had a priest as a, as a, a horrible student actually. But the effect that they had on one another and it was really what changed his life. And it's not a religious book, but it's a spiritual book, if that makes sense. So I hope, and I, but I think all books are like that. They, they're they about a healing of some sort. All right, thanks so much. Anyone else? I can go next. Um, when I started the, the book, writing the book, we were at the height of a lot of gang killings in Salinas. And I, felt that that really uh, portrayed Salinas in a really bad light. There's beautiful kids in this, in this area. There's a lot of love here. And I wanted that to be shown. I wanted these, um, the beauty of this city to come through. And so that's why um, I want people who read these to get to see the kids, the young people who live here as people of promise, as people who are just trying really hard to do their best within the limited circumstances they have because so many of, of them are children of farm workers, children of immigrants who uh, perhaps don't have a lot more in terms of financial uh, finances, but they have a lot of spirit, strong cultures, love, uh, strong values, and and they're just beautiful people. And that's what I want people to get away to get uh, from this book. Thank you so much, Martha or Robert. Uh, I'll go quick, Robert, and then I'll leave you with the last uh, bit, if that's okay. Um, I think it's really important to uh, let readers know uh, exactly how many obstacles kids who are struggling have, and they absolutely need help. It doesn't matter how uh, strong the kid is, um, how tough they are, everybody needs help. And uh, I hope that that's what uh, comes through, is it's through friendship, it's through uh, uh, offering resources, uh, it's through uh, supporting those kids through programs. For example, uh, Claudia had mentioned in her community uh, and uh, Robert has mentioned in his community as well. Uh, so uh, I hope that encourages people to reach out and uh, help one another. Wonderful, thank you so much. All right, Robert, take us home. I wanna thank everybody just for the opportunity to present our work. And I wanna also thank my panelists. I hope that re readers of my book was to strive to be your truest authentic self. Um, most of my books are about dealing with the double bind of you know being a person of color, uh, dealing with the, the community that they're from, having one foot in, one foot out. Um, your truest friends, in order to avoid peer pressure, they're, they're still going to be there. Your true friends um, won't continue to you know, allow you to, to fall a victim to peer pressure. So it's okay to be book smart and street smart. And um, just that double consciousness piece is what my, you know, my books tend to speak to. Um, and just a quick plug is I've, I've been lucky enough to be, to be featured at colleges and some high schools and some middle schools. And I, I do workshops on trauma-informed care, creative writing, memoir writing, college readiness, and and uh, career exploration. So I just wanna thank everybody uh, from the local lit community for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Wonderful, thanks so much. And thank you to all of you panelists. It's been wonderful hearing about your inspirations and your stories. I look forward to reading all of your books. I've added them onto what is always a very large to be read list, it seems I have. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna wrap up this panel and we're going to move on to the next thing. Hold on just one second. Thank you again, everybody. Next slide, please. Thank you, Dana. 
All right, everybody, we're going to run a little bit over, but um, I hope you can stick to your seats um, because if you are a writer, you'll perhaps learn something new about resources to publish your work. If you are interested in writing, um, these are some uh, avenues that you might take to get that book out of your system and onto the page. Okay, next slide, please. Emily, take it away. Thank you so much, Deborah. Um, as you mentioned, uh, my name is Emily, and I'm with the team behind the Indie Author Project and Press Books Public, uh, which are two free indie author services and resources that are available through the San Jose Public Library. Um, we're really excited to chat with everyone today to kind of very briefly share uh, what these two resources are kind of capable of, what you have access to. Um, and starting with Pressbooks Public, as you can see here, um, Pressbooks Public is a really neat digital self-publishing tool that allows local authors and writers to be able to um, write, edit, format, design, and produce professional quality, uh, both print-ready and ebook files, um, all through the library subscription on a totally kind of unlimited basis, meaning you can create as many different book files and as many different formats and editions as you might like. Um, and one thing that's really nice about the Pressbooks tool is that it's really accessible um, in the sense that it doesn't require any advanced design or tech experience whatsoever. Um, and in the sense that it's available to authors and writers kind of no matter where you're at in the writing process. Um, so whether you've just started putting words down for a new project or you have multiple completed manuscripts or anywhere in between, um, there's some really simple, easy ways for you to get your content into your account and exported in the professional format or professional quality format of your choosing. Um, and if we could pop over to the next slide here, um, creating a book with Pressbooks Public is as simple as these kind of five steps you see here. Just create your Pressbooks account, um, create a new book in your account, just adding your book details, like title, author name, um, add your content in whatever process you'd like, whether that's copying and pasting, writing directly into Pressbooks, or importing an entire existing document. Um, then you can design your whole manuscript with just one click of a button by selecting from our pre-made design templates, and then export your book file in whatever format you'd like, whether it's Mobi, EPUB, or print-ready PDF. Um, you have kind of total control of the process from start to finish, um, and again, all through your library subscription. Um, and to access this tool, as well as the Indie Author Project, which I'll touch on in just a moment here, um, you can just go to the San Jose Public Library website, select that learning header there at the top, um, and you'll see the Pressbooks link, as well as the Indie Author Project link in the personal growth section. Um, and I know I've already taken a few minutes chatting about Pressbooks here, uh, but beyond that, I do also, want to kind of wrap up by mentioning the Indie Author Project as well. Um, also available through San Jose Public Library as well as hundreds of participating libraries all across the US and Canada. Um, the Indie Author Project is a year round, um, non-exclusive discovery program kind of designed to help connect independent local authors with public libraries and readers. Um, and by submitting your ebook or ebooks to the Indie Author Project, um, you're able to expand your readership and reach new audiences by making your work available to participating libraries throughout the state and potentially through participating libraries all across the US and Canada, um, as well as potentially being able to earn usage based royalties um, if your ebook or ebooks are chosen by our curation partners as being one of the kind of best of the best out of all of these submissions that we get each year. Um, and one of the most recent kind of library patron profiles that was, or surveys that was conducted by our partners over at Library Journal um, indicated that over 50% of library users go on to purchase books by an author that they discovered through the library, um, which we think is a great trend to be able to see, something that we think is Definitely kind of encouraging the work going on over at the Indie Author Project. And another quick fun fact is a couple of our authors participating in some of the panels tonight um, already have some of their eBooks included in the Indie Author Project collections, which is always great to see. 
Um, but again, to kind of wrap up here, if we pop to the last slide, um, to access both of these tools, both Pressbooks and the, and the Author Project, again, you can go to the San Jose Public Library website, in that learning header um, in the personal growth section, you'll see links to both of those. Um, and from there, you can also reach out to us directly if you have any questions at all, whether you're already participating or looking to maybe submit your book or create a book. Um, we're more than happy to answer any questions at all that you might have for us. So thank you so much for letting us um, be a part of this evening's event or this afternoon's event. Um, we're really looking forward to seeing some more of you participating. So thank, thank you so much. You. For Thank you very much, Emily. So everybody, um, you know, you want to uh, conquer the world, we'll start at the library and uh, get those words into print and out to your audience. Thank you very much, Emily. Okay, um, now we have our very own uh, Rosemary Van Lair, um, who is going to let you all know about short editions. Take it away, Rosemary. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm, I'm typing in the chat here for everyone sjpl.org slash winter, because when we put this slide um, deck together, this, this concept hadn't happened yet, but we are starting a short story contest um, in conjunction with our first ever winter reading program, um, December 13th. And there will be both a graphic panel contest and a short story contest, and both will be going through short editions. So short edition, you can see here, um, the URL is here if you wanna check it out yourself. This is for the um, larger company, which is based in France. And you can see a dispenser, the library now owns two of these dispensers, but of course, due to COVID, we don't have them out in our libraries or in our communities yet. But the idea behind them is when you are waiting somewhere, either in the library, or maybe we would put one at the airport, um, somewhere where you're waiting in line, you would have the joy of clicking a button and a randomly dispensed short story would entertain you and brighten your day. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So since we couldn't get those dispensers out, what we have instead on our um, library website, you can randomly read um, stories and we have a we are building a collection from our community so um, most of the stories that you're going to see generated are, will be from their broader internationally curated collection but we're starting to build our own San Joséian stories as well from your submissions next slide please so this is what it looks like this is um, not a local story. This is one that, that they curate, but this is someone picked, pressed a button for three minutes and, and there it is. And I think, I think that's it. Do I have any more slides, Deborah? I think that's- No. Nope. I think that's okay. it. That's it. Thank you all so much. That was amazing. I have um, written, to, I, I've done my Christmas shopping now. So thank you. <laughs> Authors, you never know where the library will take you. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Okay, um, now we are going to present our slides of thanks. Take it away, Dana. Sorry, I'm <laughs> sorry. Hi. <laughs> I'm having some technical difficulties trying to do slides in this. Anyway, I would very much like to thank, of course, all the readers. Uh, if it weren't for you, these wonderful authors, would their stories wouldn't be heard or understood or un absorbed by anybody. Um, as a librarian and part of the library system, readers are our heart and lifeblood, and we just can't thank you enough for being involved with us and reading with us and being a part of our community. So thank you so much to our readers. Thank you, Dana. Next slide. And authors, where would we be? This wouldn't have happened without you. I'd like to thank Brad Ashmore, Cassie Kiefer, Charles Joseph Albert, Claudia Melendez Salinas, Dan Brook, Daniel E. Johnson, E.K. Trimberger, Enrique S. Flores, and Gary Singh. Next slide, please. To continue, Jenny Cl Clendenin, Kathleen Ann Gonzalez, Lisa Francesca, Linda Ulis. I hope I got your name right. 
<laughs> sorry, Luann Aleas, Maya Catherine Bonoff, MD New, Martha Engberg, Marta Hernandez. Thank you all. Next slide, please. Thank you, authors Nelly Nuri, Palma Pickering, Robert Ricardo Reese, Robert Mosi Alexander, Tina Jones Williams, Tom Liggett, and Valerie Estelle Frankel. Next slide, please. Yeah, we'd also like to thank our colleagues from San Jose State University and San Jose Public Library and Biblio Board. And Aggie, Emily Chan, both from SJSU, Emily Gooding from Biblio Board, Jill Bourne, John Saver Cool from San Jose Public Library, Justin Vienna from SJSU, Kun Warpreet Singh Bahar from SJPL, and also, of course, Michelle Ornott and Rosemary Van Lair from San Jose Public Library. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Peggy. Peggy? You're muted, unmute. Okay, we want to hear you. Uh, just unmute. Okay, sure. now you're on. Good. On behalf of the Local Lit 2020 Organizing Committee, I want to thank everybody, our audience, our participants, our volunteers who have assisted us. Um, that includes Dana Lima from San Jose Public Library, Deborah Streicher, San Jose Public Library, Fred O'Leary, a volunteer from San Jose Public Library, Jane Dodge from San Jose State, Lucille Boone, San Jose Public Library, Megan Hicks, San Jose Public Library, myself representing San Jose State University, and Tony Loeb, a volunteer from San Jose Public Library. And I think we have a slide that got skipped through. If you would just go back one more. There we go. No, we did that one. Oh, did we? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. Everybody, I want to thank you for being with us. Um, committee, thank you for all of the hard work that you've done. Authors, again, without you, um, this wouldn't have happened. And uh, Rosemary and um, Emily, thank you for giving us information on how to um, get that book out and uh, into the hands of uh, our reading public. Everybody, I bid you a very good evening. Thank you again for being with us this afternoon. Bye, everybody. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, authors. Thank you, audience, for participating with us. Thank you, San Jose Public Library and everybody who put this together. Wonderful job. Thank you. It was a lovely afternoon. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Deborah. This is Robert. I really appreciate the opportunity. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye, Robert. Thank you, and everybody for being with us. Wouldn't have happened without you. All right, I am going to um, end this session. Um, everybody who's worked so hard to put this together, thank you for um, thank you for being with with me um, and making this go forward. You are you've just been beautiful to work with. Thank you so much. Awesome job, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.